Okay, I'd like to get started here. Thank you for all uh, showing me up uh, the East Dundee Board of Trustees regular meeting dated Monday, August 19th, 2024. I've got 602. Franco, you take the roll. Trustee Sauter? Here. Trustee Saviano? Here. Trustee Triber? Here. Trustee Kunze? Present. Trustee Mahoney? Here. Trustee Bridgen? Here. And President Lineman? Here. And if you'll rise with me for the clip. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. That'll bring us to public comment. Is there anyone in the audience who'd like to address the board on a, an agenda or a non agenda item? I didn't receive any, but if it appears we won't. I'm sure we're going to have public conversation. If uh, I did not get a chance to submit the form, I was not aware of it, but it's I may be seen. Where's your assistant? If you give us your name and address, please. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Dave David uh, from uh, 146 Crestwood Drive. Uh, Crestwood? Yeah, I'm here from East Andy. Good evening. Um, more than a month ago, you were sent letters addressing a broader issue. Uh, the responses I received indicated that those of you who did read the emails uh, did not read the attached letters in part or in whole. Yet another response deflected the issue to the police, an institution that is to be blamed for the present situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, and if you read the emails, you would know what I mean exactly. Today I've come to address several deficits in the local ordinance. First of all, regarding the, fa uh, the fence permits. They require that adjacent fences be built no less than three feet away from existing fences. Uh, this protects existing uh, fence structures and their bases from getting damaged by new holes as they're drilled into the ground for the construction of the new fence. They also allow enough space between the fences for maintenance. However, no protection is offered against deliberate forms of vandalism through terrain modifications, examples of which include digging a trench next to a fence, removing the soil around the basis of the fence post to the, to the point where they're exposed, or rarefying the soil by replacing it with mulch or other uh, inserts that may decrease its density and therefore st destabilize it. Inserting plastic wraps that prevent water from draining can also further destabilize the soil and uh, allow for enough moisture to build up to allow picket fences with wooden posts to rot quicker than the normal wood. Mm -hmm. The local ordinance also does not protect residents from other residents who invite lots of people into their homes on a regular basis and turn the entire street and the neighboring properties into a playground instead of utilizing actual playgrounds that are meant for those purposes. I ask the board to prohibit excessive sport activities, large gathering and gatherings and other activities that disturb the peace, rob others of their rest, and result in trespass of land on a regular basis. The ordinance also does not uh, protect residents from bright or visually irritating lights that are within line of sight or reflect brightly off of shiny surfaces in a way that uh, the light is also essentially pointed towards a neighboring property. Uh, examples may include uh, bright LED halogens, or they are not really halogens, just bright LED spotlights, other uh, visually um, other lights that cause visual discomfort, uh, UV lights or lights that appear like UV lights uh, would be an example of that, or lights that uh, have a strobe to them or create a visual discomfort by flickering or any other visual effects. The ordinance is of course meaningless if there is nobody to enforce it. The police has refused to enforce the dog ordinance, even when a neighbor's pit bull has been let loose repeatedly onto our, our driveway. And even as it attacked a passerby and his dog, the police have brushed it off and thrown accusations back at us for reporting the incident and showing them proof of it. 
they refused to enforce the no trespassing of land ordinance and disorderly conduct ordinances every time uh, certain neighbors uh, trespass onto our front yard and shower us with curses and threats, even in the presence of the police officers. Through a series of events that were described in, details, in detail in the letters sent to you, it became apparent that the police, as an institution, chooses to punish the innocent and pardon the guilty, spread slander and sow discord within the neighborhood. To elaborate on this point, uh, in the course of uh, performing some of their so-called investigations, as they spoke to all their neighbors who were entirely uh, disassociated with uh, the issues that we encountered. The police essentially began to, en to involve others and effectively brainwashed them into believing things that were false, even when no previous issues existed with them, between us and said neighbors. I encourage the board to take the blatant negligence of duty shown by the police seriously and take appropriate measures. The village administration has similarly refused to enforce the ordinance related to trees and shrubs on village property that prohibits the attachment of objects to them. When confronted with concerns regarding a fake letter sent to my household, as if it were sent from the village, we were told, don't push back. Let the bully get tired and bored until it stops. I am asking the board to step in by making appropriate revisions to the ordinances that will not only serve to alleviate the present situation, but prevent others from arising in the future. I am asking the board to exercise its authority over the police and ensure that ordinances are being enforced and not their private opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Speak with you after the meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? All right. Hello, I'm Blair Model. <coughs> um, I've got a property that you guys might know of is 315 4th Street, the Spartan Axe building. Mm -hmm. And I've been getting a lot of calls from our from Chris and Erie, we've been going back and forth on that one. Um, evidently, the Spartan Axe people have listed the business for sale on Biz Buy Sell, um, and that's true. Uh, they're trying to sell out of that or get out of that one, <coughs> but in the meantime, the business is or the building is not for sale. Um, so that's been brought up a couple times. So if anybody's getting questions on this, um, they seem to be coming like they're working through a broker and they're at a certain stage where it's relevant. Whereas I'm not hearing anything about this; they're just coming straight to you guys on that one. Uh, so just as everybody knows that. Uh, and then this, I do have another question. I don't know who to reach out to on the transferability of that gaming license. Um, that seems to have some value to people and I just don't know how those work. So I don't know who the proper person would be to follow up on that one. Okay, well, um, when a new proprietor were to move in, they would have to come to us and we put that process in motion. For, so it would essentially be, you know, just a continuation of it, but all the information that would no normally be needed is going to certainly be needed with a new proprietor. So, yeah, yeah. you know, but um, if there's gaming in there now, um, and there, we haven't had any problems or issues with that, I wouldn't anticipate any problem with it continuing. So, okay. um, I don't know if this is something or information that you would need in order to find a new tenant. Well, I guess um, I'm trying to figure out. Um, <clears throat> If the new tenant needs to buy the business from the old person to acquire the gaming license, oh, no, no, or no. if they just come in here fresh to you, and if they come in fresh, they fresh. still yeah, go the gaming license don't transfer. They don't transfer. Yeah, they don't transfer. transfer. No. They, okay. they would have yeah. to apply for yeah. a new license. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then does that take the typical six month process with the state mm -hmm. of Illinois to make that all happen? Uh, yes. I don't know whatever about the process. Whatever the, the state process state of Illinois state. state. Yeah. Okay. So and regardless right. of how it goes, they're going to go through you. You guys go through the state, right. and it's normal timeline. Same would yes. hold for the liquor license because they currently have one, but it mm -hmm. doesn't follow the establishment. It follows the proprietor. Okay. So yeah. when they, in other words, then when the Duros family were to sell the business, the license becomes null and void, and then whoever is now the new tenant would have to come and start that process new. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. That's all I was looking for. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, 
Anybody else who'd like to adjust the board? No? Seeing none. Oh, could you? Is it on this specific issue or It's uh, on any agenda or non agenda item, so whatever you'd like to adjust the board on is the floor is yours. You just give us your name and address. Um, my name is Julie Fleischer. I'm at 25 One Holst Avenue. Um, I've been having some significant issues with getting um, a lot of violation. And I've been dealing with a lot of harassment with my neighbors, and I've come to the village for three years now regarding a lot of these issues that I'm now getting uh, violations over and I don't know what to do about this um, I've asked you guys repeatedly for assistance um, I, I am on disability I've had repeated surgeries and I've gotten nowhere with you guys now I'm getting violations I'm getting harassment from my neighbors and they're leaving notes on vehicles um, the police are very aware of what is going on and I have dealt with the Forest Preserve as well. I've lost my homeowner's insurance because of the issues that I've been dealing with with the Forest Preserve. Um, and I've gotten nowhere with any of this. So now it's come to that I have been extremely polite with you guys and you guys are not finding me and I don't know what to do. Well, I'll certainly help uh, if you would like to take it offline because it sounds like it's a little more information than we'd be able to discuss Absolutely. here now. So if after the meeting you're still available, I'll sit with Thank you and we'll you. discuss what's going on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing none, okay, that'll take us to our consent agenda. If I could have a motion. Uh, that's a big <coughs> one, so. Can I ask to um, pull, sorry, um, items D and E into the other agenda items? I just want to discuss a couple of things publicly. As well as C for me. We'll see as well. Yes, please. Okay, so I move to approve a regular village board meeting minutes dated July fifteenth, twenty twenty-four. I will move to accept warrants list in the amount of one million thirty-one thousand eight hundred twenty-two dollars and forty-eight cents and three hundred thirty-nine thousand eight hundred eighty-four and thirteen cents. I will move to approve a resolution adopting the 2024 Kane County Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. And finally, I will move to approve an ordinance terminating the designation of the Prairie Lakes Tax Increment Financing <coughs> District Development Project Area and dissolving the Prairie Lakes Tax Increment Financing District Fund. I'll second. Any questions on those items? Comments? No? Franco. Trustee Sauter. Yes. Trustee Saviano? Yes. Trustee Triber? Yes. Trustee Kunze? Yes. Trustee Mahoney? Yes. Trustee Britta? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then let's discuss item C. Um, if we could have a motion for that. I'll make a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the village administrator to enter into an engineering services agreement with Gerald L. Hines and Associate for the Barrington Avenue resurfacing project. Second. Okay. Andy, you had questions on this. Yeah, more of a, uh, a comment on something to look into as we're uh, looking into the engineering for this. Uh, since this is connecting Water Street where we're doing the development and Barrington going up to, out towards 68, that's kind of a, where we're talking about doing a protected bike lane possibly. So if we could look at that when we look at the engineering cost to see uh, would that be feasible to put a protected bike lane because it does connect the downtown to the terrace and there is a lot of bike traffic already going up and down that hill. Uh, now that there's e-bikes and e-scooters, that hill is totally doable and people are going up and down it all the time. So um, just wanted to see if that could be included in this engineering study. Okay, um, Joe isn't here, is he? No. no. Yeah, I would. I would want to talk to him too about the funding for it. Uh, it was probably 30, 35 years ago, perhaps, when we redid that initially, and we received a fair, fairly amount, a fairly good amount, I should say, of funding for. Um, considering it was a main artery going through the town, we uh, 
I want to say at the time it was six hundred thousand dollars, and it was nearly half the cost to resurface it. So, um, but the other thing I'd like to talk about too is if we are going to continue to allow, or continue to need to allow, truck traffic to go through there, and, and if that's the main artery, which it should be, we need to make sure that the resurfacing is done to accommodate that weight. Because currently it's not, um, and it's getting chewed up, uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, so. <coughs> Are we planning on, during this resurfacing, doing any lead pipe changing outs on this, on Barrington? Are we aiming for that, at least, or no? So it's my understanding Phil? in the late, oh. Thank you. Yeah. It's my understanding in the late 90s, um, when the road was last resurfaced, um, lead services were replaced between the main and each B box. So we're going to be conducting a survey to determine how many, if any, lead services still exist between the main and the B boxes. Okay. Now, nothing was replaced, at least not through the village's project, from the B boxes to, the, to each home. All right. So we don't believe we have many lead service issues Okay. Um, along the project. And just a quick note, the limits of this particular project, this STP project, are from 68 down to Van Buren. So okay. these types of STP projects have to terminate at other, F, uh, other routes that are part of the federal aid urban system, and 68 is, as is Van Buren. So beyond that, um, anything west of Van Buren would have to be a, a separate study. Okay. Or inclusion and yeah, means. it seems like it's going to be several efforts, but working towards getting a stretch eventually um, that goes all the way out to because the uh, Palumbo property that is being developed mm -hmm. is going to have bike lanes from 68 out. So from 68, like where the library is, to Barrington would be a, a different project, but this would fill in some of the gaps between getting all the way down to the river, to the river. and the downtown mostly. And are you saying for the water that since we're not disturbing from the main to the B box that we aren't required to do to check the homes? Or are you saying that you don't think any of those homes on our inventory do have lead? Because if, if we do need to dig it up eventually, when we're tearing up the road would probably be better before we tear it up, if we do have to eventually. Our inventory, if any of those lead services between the V-Box and each home were not replaced, then those homes are still on the lead service line inventory, even though it's a partial lead service line, not a full. Mm -hmm. And if, if they're copper or another non-lead product material type between the main and the V-Box, then we would not have to dig up the street at any point. So our objective is to determine, we're looking to call it potholing or create, excavate down to each B box to determine what material type we have on either side of the Buffalo box. So the resurfacing of Barrington Avenue is not going to affect anything as far as a lead service line replacement from the box to the home? Correct. There's no rework in other correct. words? Correct. Okay. That's correct. I so we have some things to do to identify which if there are any existing lead services at the main, we have some work to do to identify those. Yeah, but makes sense. With the cost savings on the, the federal funding, <laughs> it's, it's worth expediting this project to next well, year. Well, and funding for this, I mean, would um, this be something that Joe would take on for us? Or would that be something we would have to do from either state or federal money? You mean in terms no. of the engineering? No, in terms of the actual work. Well, in the re-engineering, too. I mean, it all goes into it. It's probably going to be a million and a half to redo it maybe more I'm just wondering if would Joe be um, maybe submitting for a grant money on our behalf or would we need to do that for this project yeah. so this project is there are federal um, surface transportation program funds available for this project it's mm -hmm. a 75 25 split 75 federal funds and it's Wonderful. the funds are, are allocated through KKCOM and CMAP so it's a um, but so the project construction wise we're projecting about just under five hundred thousand oh. dollars and it's a 75 25 split for okay for, it's all right in your packet on page 29 Jeff okay so all broken out beautifully 
are there possible incentives if we were to make a protected bike lane that there might be some grant funding towards converting a street that didn't have a bike lane to one that did? We'd have to see if through this program those types of additional um, aspects of the project could be included. There may be some paperwork that would, would be necessary. Um, so that's something we'd have to look into and I could certainly do that here in the coming Thank days, you. weeks. So when, when you're talking about a protected bike lane, are you thinking a curb separating the bike lane from this roadway or a painted bike lane or um, bollards? There are a lot of different ways that I've seen, but maybe kind of like parking blocks that can be set on the road. I've seen that sometimes to make it so that cars can't just drift into it um, so that it's not a shared lane where it's really no different than what we have where there, if there isn't enough room and you're just having paint. Um, but yeah, if possible, protected is I think the, the standard of what is the safest for the biker and the most comfortable for the motorist, but depends on how much width we have available and street parking. So I know there's logistic <laughs> issues that engineering will have to look into. And we have a number of residents along Barrington that do like the, <coughs> the park, the existing parking lane. So logistically, can we accommodate two ways, a two way, two directional, two way directional flow of traffic plus a, a parking lane plus a, a, a bike lane? It would kind of tight. But is there parking seven. allowed on each side? No. Ah, uh, no, just, just the south side. side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there enough time without jeopardizing this grant money to have Joe evaluate if we can do an on street bike lane as part of the project? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. And also, you're going to make sure that all of the lead service lines that are under the street will be replaced before we actually construct. Yes. Currently, we're soliciting proposals to conduct that analysis survey for us. Cool. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Were there any other questions, comments on C? No? Franco. Trustee Sauter. Yes. Trustee Saviano. Yes. Trustee Triber. Yes. Trustee Kunze. Yes. Trustee Mahoney? Yes. And Trustee Britton? Yes. And that'll take us to item D in the consent agenda if we could have a motion. I'll move to approve an ordinance amending sections 9401 and 151002 and repealing sections 94, 4.02, 94.03, 90.04, 151.014, and 151.021 of the Village Code requiring fire prevention and safety regulations in the village. Second. Okay. Uh, Sarah, did you call this one? Yeah, I just had a, there were a couple of things about this that I just want to clarify um, for everybody. So this is, and, and it's kind of grouped with E, so forgive me if I'm asking for, about something that actually belongs in E. Um, but this is about uh, the way that we work with our fire department. This is um, how the inspections and enforcement and all that kind of stuff works. So could we have just a quick overview of what changes, how, how this will change businesses who apply for permits or residents who have to apply for permits or anything like that? Kelsey, you want to take that? Would you like to? Sure. Fire department too? Yes, so um, several of the sections that were repealed in their entirety uh, are strictly to streamline um, and reduce any redundancy that was in the code. Mm -hmm. There was a few versions of the fire prevention, international fire prevention code that were adopted. So um, we repealed those pieces and then uh, practically speaking, it will direct applicants directly to the fire district instead of filtering them through the village hall and through the, the permit approvals process um, here with the village. It'll send them directly to the fire district, who, to the best of my knowledge, uh, already uh, does their handles of those okay. of those yeah. Those. yeah, and so it'll just We're removing the redundancy. Yes. Okay. Yep. So it's yep. you guys already do your own permits. Okay. So it's not like this is an extra step that people are going to have to go through. It's a step they've already had to go through in the past. It's just streamlining the village connect the telephone game. Yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you and so that much. That allows the village to also condition their approvals on fire district. Okay. Plan approval as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yep. So is it 
fair to say that anytime we have a change in the codes for fire prevention that we're going to see this so it's yes and no kind of a housekeeping kind of thing you still have control over this I'm I know I don't mean to denigrate anybody but it, it gives me a little pause when whatever a village or us especially is are going to just relinquish control to anybody outside the, the control of the staff um, because we don't have a say in it um, I don't want to suggest that this is just going to become a revenue generator for you but what no. what no. keeps somebody and i mean i know this is way out in the sticks but we have some old buildings in our downtown absolutely what would keep a a future fire board or department from coming in and saying everybody's got to get fire suppression at a cost of two two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per it would end up closing half our town so there's a section in the fire code that directly addresses existing buildings and structures which is actually doesn't fall under your written building code that you guys uh, have signed in. Mm -hmm. So when an existing building gets a new occupancy, then it is uh, part of building code and fire code, those need to be upgraded, correct? Yes. However, those only need to be upgraded per what that existing chapter in the fire code recommends it to be. Now there is a term grandfather, but we're not, we don't make existing buildings install sprinklers unless they're going to do something completely hazardous not a line there's a leniency there what makes this easier and streamlines it nothing's changing currently what is already being done uh, if a new business comes into the village as of right now they go to the village they get their occupancy inspection and they get all their permits from the village and then they have to come across the line and come to us and get ours as well all this is doing is streamlining this together which is something we're already doing me and mr ranieri over phone and it's making it more of a legal aspect at this time. Um, this ties into other operational permits as well. As an example, we'll use the food truck for an example. You can solely rely on us now legally instead of saying, oh yeah, it's okay, we did it on our own as far as inspections and, and safety is concerned on that aspect. Um, this will 100% not change anything that's already been in process at this time. No cost differences to the businesses. Everything's already been and the only thing we charge is impact fees and then permit fees. Nothing's changed. The impact fees are already a written ordinance, and, you're, and that's not changing. So No, which can be considerable depending on the type and size of the development. Absolutely. <clears throat> can I ask where those impact fees go? Where they go? They are go they to the, a reserve account? I'm or sorry? Do they go to a reserve account? No, they go in the operational budget of the fire district. The fire district relies solely on tax income and those impact fees. That's all we operate on. Okay. So in our district, is split between two counties so those counties funds go to that county yeah. well <clears throat> impact fees for water and so forth are something that we rely on as well because mm -hmm. everything below grade is on us so what's the likelihood that the fire department would be willing to share in that generation of revenue so our impact fees are solely on buildings built nothing else no utilities no water mains no electrical strictly structures built and that impact fee is applied for the projected cost of what it's going to take to protect that building on the fire side. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in and builds a 10 acre commercial warehouse, that's going to reproject 911 calls for EMS calls to that, gas cost to that, manpower to that building. That's where those impact fees came from. Unfortunately, those were written in the ordinance way before my arrival in this area, so I can't tell you how it was exactly broken down. But as far as those going up, they're not, going, they're not going up anytime soon. Okay. So if in the event somebody in the downtown had a store down below, wanted to renovate the upstairs for a B&B, &B, which has been done in this town and others, mm -hmm. um, would, would that new code require a suppression system for up above and therefore down below? It depends on you. So that, did you say Airbnb, is that what you said? Yeah. There's so if it was an Airbnb, that would fall under the residential code, and that's whatever Chris Ranieri uh, requires them to get installed. The fire district's uh, fire code mm -hmm. does not uh, imply anything towards residential, okay. unless it's an apartment or condo and it's common, common ways and common areas, that's it. Okay. As far as living units, uh, the fire code does not address those. It's 100% on the building code. That's kind of why it makes this operation a little bit better, too, because if you lay the building and fire code directly next to each other, chapters three and eight through both mirror. But the building code may say reference chapter 12 of the fire code, but 
Mr. Ranieri can't enforce Chapter 12 of the fire code, but I can. Mm -hmm. And my code may say reference Chapter 11 in the building code. I can't enforce Chapter 11 in the building code, but Mr. Ranieri can. Mm -hmm. And that's where we had to make this verbal agreement in the past to make it work for the better of the businesses so there wasn't any headaches moving forward. Okay. okay, then the only other question I have is with regard to an intergovernmental agreement. Did L. Rod weigh in on this, or can you? Um, I mean, have you wait, you've reviewed wait, it. That's E. Wait. That's the next thing. Oh, sorry. But isn't that E? And we're talking it is, about yeah, that's E. Well, okay. okay. Can I ask you a question that's slightly yeah, absolutely. related, slightly unrelated? Uh, we had an accident at the Santa's Village. Somebody fell off of a ride. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we generally want to believe that Santa's Village is doing a great job with their rides and safety and everything like that. But do you guys oversight that at all for their rides? And so Santa's Village rides are oversighted by the Office of State Fire Marshal. Um, I have requested them to advise me when they go out every year, but I do get proof that they do go out every year and inspect those rides. Okay. There are other aspects of the park that do need a little bit better oversight, but with the village's help, that will be, that will, that's, hopefully this will help that out as well, because there is a lot of um, development within the park that doesn't really fall under code, but still needs oversight, and they kind of just been, yeah. yeah so we're working on that, me and Mr. Ranieri together. Okay. So All fireworks right. show that uh, was an example. He wanted to host a fireworks show. And then we went in there, Chris called me, and I went in and did an inspection of the land and said, this is what you're going to need to do to provide the show before you go to the board to ask permission. And it ended there. So, okay. No, but the State Fire Marshal Office does inspect every single ride. Okay. Absolutely. That, that's a state law. All right. Thank <laughs> so. you. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Bronco. Trustee Sauter. Yes. Trustee Saviano. Yes. Mark. Stay. Trustee Triber? Yes. Trustee Kunze? Yes. Trustee Mahoney? Yes. Trustee Britton? Yes. Okay, thank you. And that will take us then to item E. Uh, move to approve resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement between the Village of East Dundee and the East Dundee and Countryside Fire Protection District. Second. Okay, questions? I've well, got one. Oh, go ahead. Um, another unrelated question. Absolutely. No, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> we are interested in, um, you know, you guys giving us the Firedome's Park across the street here. And I've talked to, um, you know, your chief about that. And he said, you know, that you guys might be willing to, to help us out with that. And uh, I haven't talked to him since, but I was wondering if you could maybe and put in a word for us. Um, Respectfully, sir, that is above my range. Um, <laughs> to my knowledge, uh, that land nice was owned by a resident of the village of East Dundee who was an avid supporter of the fire district back in the day prior to my arrival. Upon his passing, donated the park, and it's not even donated to the fire department. It's actually right. donated to the fire association, which right. is the charitable organization within the fire district. So that association raises funds and donates to charity every ounce of income that comes in on those rental, park rentals and everything else. That would be something that has to go to the association board. That is uh, out of my control. I cannot give you an answer on that, I apologize. Do you know anything about where this association board uh, meets? Or? I can provide you with that information, absolutely. <laughs> So with this governmental, intergovernmental agreement, rather, um, does the fire department have similar IGAs with every community within the district? Believe it or not, you guys will be our first. Everything has been a handshake up until this point, and um, our other uh, home rule agency or government within our district, which would be the Village of South Barrington, is looking at this and will be utilizing this as a backbone for them as well because their town is split between two districts, not just one. So, yeah, this is a good push forward for everything as far as code life safety is concerned, especially nowadays we need to have these in order. They can't be handshake deals anymore with these day and age, unfortunately. Okay, so... Um, you know, without the IGA, um, as stated before, the village has their rules and ordinances, which must be followed, and so do we. Ours are signed into law as well. It makes it easier on the business owners and the developers within this area to get things done quicker, more efficiently when it's when it's combined together. So, 
Is Hoffman Estates part of the district or part of Hoffman Estates? They're, they're themselves they Hoffman Estates the Village. Over there yeah. off of Beverly Hill. Okay. Um, and just like any other intergovernmental agreement, it can be rescinded for a 30 day written notice? Um, yes, we have in this agreement 90 days uh, 90. to terminate for no reason or any reason at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then 30 days written notice for a violation of the terms. Okay. All right, just let that out to the public. So, anybody else have any questions, concerns, no. comments? No? Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks. Appreciate it. Franco. Trustee Sauter? Yes. Trustee Saviano? Yes. Trustee Troiber? Yes. Trustee Kunze? Yes. Trustee Mahoney? Yes. Trustee Britton? Yes. Okay, that'll take us to our regular agenda items here. If we could have a motion for A. I'll make a motion to accept the May 1st, 2023 to December 31st, 2023 stub year annual comprehensive financial report for the village and police pension fund and place it on file. A second. Okay, is there any questions or comments? No. Do we have the auditors here? Um, we have our auditor from Ladderbach and I'm in here to discuss any changes or um, details within the audit. So, just one. Oh, I was like here, what, two months ago? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I'll keep it short and sweet. If you have any questions, please let me know. My name is Justine Kaur. I'm one of the audit managers at Ladderbach and Amen. I'm here to um, present the audit for stub year uh, ending 12-31-23. I want to start off by saying thank you to the board for having me here tonight. It's now storming for a change. <laughs> um, I would also like to give a special thank you to the staff for having us on site and bearing with us on um, ev like every audit. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with them again. Um, I know having a, like they have their own jobs and having auditors on site is Yep. Oh my God, the auditors are here. So again, it was a smooth process and no um, issues were encountered, That which is what can be found in the SAS 114 letter. Um, the next is the annual comprehensive financial report. Um, we were able to achieve the COA award again with the GFOA and we will work with uh, Brandis again next year to apply. Um, independent auditor's report, it basically talks about what their responsibility is, which is their fair presentation and preparation of the financial statements. Our responsibility is to generate an opinion on those financial statements, and I'm happy, happy to report that we've issued an unmodified opinion, which is the cleanest form of opinion we can issue and the highest level of assurance that we can issue. Um, the MDNA or the management's discussion analysis talks about basically the rest of the report and like forms of charts, words, and graphs. So it's like basically a summary. If you have any questions in particular, even after tonight that you have, um, please feel to reach out to them or us directly and we'll be happy to answer those. Again, any particular questions pertaining to the numbers, please let me know. Otherwise, I don't want to bore you with, there's a lot of numbers in the report. So um, everything was fine overall. Again, it was a short audit, so um, now, switching gears was a little like just the eighth month of it was a little tricky but again we got through it management letter comments nothing for the current uh, step year but there were some prior which you will see the Gatsby uh, pronouncements coming out and as applicable we'll work with um, the staff to implement those um, any questions again I want to keep it brief and short but um, were there any glaring problems in that uh, those new opinions that are coming out uh, just on our side to implement them, that's okay. all, but again. I mean, this is kind of a one-off type of process that we did here, so yes. to ask, you know, well, we got an unqualified opinion, that's great, or unmodified, <laughs> I'm on the public side, sorry. Um, but we, you know, I mean, if there wasn't anything that we need to look out for next time, it's, not well, really again, if, again, it's just a process. Again, nothing left. That's why we issued a modified opinion. If there are any material, like you will probably see the journal entries that we also posted to get the books to what they need to be. So again, it's just a normal process. Nothing out of the ordinary. Again, she's amazing to work with. I wasn't on this audit, but I didn't hear any bad things about the audit. So again, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, no issues at all. Okay, great, good, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. No. Great. Thank you. 
Okay. Franco. Trusty Sauter. Yes. Trusty Saviano. Yes. Trusty Triber. Yes. Trusty Quincy. Yes. Trusty Mahoney. Yes. And Trusty Britton. Yes. Okay, that'll take us to item B. Um, yeah, this one is a discussion of Village Board direction regarding Kane County's Fab, Fab Fox Water Trail Access Project. It's the creation of the water access site and proposed improvements along Bartles Park and Water Street. Uh, I believe we have people from Hay and Associates. We do. Um, and if you guys would, if you'd like to offer a couple of opening comments here. Um, Look, to I'd like to start out by re reiterating that we are pleased to have been selected by King County for their Fab Fox Water Trails Access Project. Um, as I briefly summarized in my memo, um, Administrator, Sto Administrator Storley and I have met with King County and their consultant A and Associates to discuss opportunities to engage with the Fab Fox Water Trail Access Project. Um, this opportunity would primarily involve creating an access site to the Fox River which would be incorporated into the Fabulous Fox water trail system. Um, and access would be mainly for paddle craft, so kayaks, canoes, et cetera. Um, we also discussed project ideas for improvements to Water Street and Bartles Park, some of which would be necessary with creating the river access site. Um, as you may have noticed, what is proposed in the concept <coughs> plan in front of you is a little different from what was included in the Riverfront Master Plan uh, but importantly, it provides parking for those visiting the riverfront and park and a pedestrian crossing between the park and the access site. Um, joining us this evening are Karen Miller. She's the executive planner with the Kane County Development Department. Um, also with Hay and Associates are Tim Pollowy and Ryan Alexander, are their landscape architects with Hay and Associates. Um, Karen will talk a little bit more about the trail system and the, the trail access project. Um, and Ryan will walk us through the concept plan that you have in front of you. Um, also with us this evening is Dave Peterson, the Executive Director with the Dundee Township Park District. As the, the village owns the Park District property, but we have an intergovernmental agreement with the Park District and they essentially maintain it, uh, maintain the park. So, Karen. This is Karen Miller. Good evening. I'm Karen Miller with uh, the Kane County Development Department, and I am also the Illinois co-chair of the uh, Fabulous Fox National Water Trail. And I just wanted to give you a, a brief background information about the, um, so it's second from the top, and then it's inside that one. It's um, East Dundee, second from the top. So good evening, as I said, I'm Karen Miller. I'm executive planner with the Kane County Development Department and also the Illinois co-chair of the Fabulous Fox National Water Trail. I wanted to give you some background information about the Fabulous Fox Water Trail since we are looking at providing an access site to East Dundee. So on June 2nd of last year, Secretary Deborah Holland, the Interior Secretary, designated the um, Fabulous Fox Water Trail as part of the National Water Trail System. There's only about 35 water trails that are part of this system. And I worked with a group of stakeholders along the Fox River in both Wisconsin and Illinois for about five years to create the water trail and to meet the criteria that is required by the National Park Service. And our application ended up being about 100 pages long. So the Fabulous Fox National Water Trail is 158 fabulous miles across two states and seven counties with over 70 public access sites. Our vision was to provide a water trail that has suitable access to the public to enjoy the quiet and active recreation, the scenic beauty, the abundant wildlife and historic and cult cultural features, and also to increase tourism and economic development, which has been found in other nationally designated water trails around the country. 
communities along the Fox River embrace stewardship and public engagement to provide a sense of place. So you can plan your trip at www.fabulousfoxwatertrail.org where we have included detailed information about the access sites. We have dozens of itineraries. Also within those itineraries are links to local businesses and activities to help support economic development. And we also have downloadable maps. We've divided the river into 14 segments. So you can take those maps with you on the river when you paddle. So moving forward, the Kane County Board a couple of years ago um, took $1.2 million of our American Rescue Plan funding and allotted it for planning, marketing, infrastructure for new and approved access and signage along the water trail in Kane County. We also applied for and received a $270,000 grant for improvement to construction of new access sites from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Econo Economic Opportunity, and also another $100,000 as part of another grant for marketing, which we are in the process of doing. So as part of this, we're calling this the Kane County Access Infrastructure Project. As, as, as I mentioned, it's funded by the Kane County American Rescue Plan and the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. We have contracted with Hay & Associates to go through these five phases that you see here. And we have completed the first two phases of outreach and data gathering and also feasibility and prioritization. And we were excited to list East Dundee as being one of the top projects in our um, feasibility and prioritization phase. So now we are working with Hay on engineering, design, and permitting. And um, Hay can, can provide further information, or Phil, would you? Yeah, no, I'll turn it over to Ryan if you want to take us through the concept. Uh, good evening, my name is Ryan Alexander with Hay & Associates. I'm a landscape architect. Uh, we've, as Karen mentioned, we've been working with them on the Kane County Fabulous, Fabulous Fox Access Water Trail Project. And village staff approached us seeing an opportunity to sort of piggyback on, on that uh, Kane County project to revisit the uh, master plan for Bartels Park. Uh, as uh, Phil mentioned the previous uh, master plan done a few years ago had the complete closure of Water Street, uh, but given the uh, inclusion of the uh, kayak launch, uh, we, they saw an opportunity to provide parking for uh, kayak users, uh, watercraft users, uh, giving them a place to park to utilize that, uh, that launch location. Uh, so with that, we redeveloped that master plan to partially close, well, it, it we're fully closing Water Street and turning it into a one-way in, one-way out parking lot going uh, northbound upstream on the river uh, with angled parking. Uh, and through the center of the parking lot is a raised uh, crosswalk uh, a platform area to kind of slow down people driving through the parking lot and provide that access from parking spaces over to the uh, launch location. Uh, in redeveloping the master plan, we wanted to incorporate as many of those previous elements as possible. So we've uh, kind of redone the layout of the overall park, including uh, adding in the, uh, the new play area, uh, adding in a uh, half court basketball where currently you have a uh, full court basketball. The half court lends itself more towards families versus uh, teenagers and young adult pickup games. And then also including a pickleball court which has been uh, kind of gaining steam in the parks and recreation community. Uh, we've kind of flip-flopped the location of the uh, basketball and pickleball with the play area. So here on the plan 
the existing playground is where the basketball and pickleball are. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've moved that north so that the noisier activities of the basketball and pickleball are further away from the residents. Um, we've incorporated a couple of pedestrian uh, entrance plazas that will have some monument walls and uh, opportunities for public sculpture uh, it, to serve as a welcoming uh, feature for pedestrians walking through the park. Uh, along the river, there's going to be more naturalized improvements. Uh, so we've got kind of pulling off of the kayak launch access path uh, a swing pergola, and this is not a playground swing, these are bench swings. Uh, so instead of having fixed in ground benches, they're uh, swing benches, so similar to like an A-frame bench swing in the backyard. Uh, and then adding in more ornamental plantings um, along the, the pergola access path and a you know, tertiary level, uh, less improved access path of the flagstone steppers, that'll be more of a get out into nature, get out into the gardens element. Um, so the difference between like the ornamental plantings and naturalized plantings that would be done uh, th along the rest of the river is that the ornamental plantings are going to be more intentional, uh, more ornamental and structured. Uh, also included along the riverbank are uh, several outcropping areas and these would be large stone blocks that would provide people with uh, stairs down to the water where people could engage with the water, fish from uh, a couple of the outcropping locations. And then also there's a fishing pier downstream of the launch, which is a preferred location to uh, reduce the conflict between fishing lines and uh, watercraft. <laughs> We've also included the multi-use trail, which uh, I've gathered there's been some interest with uh, having the um, bike lanes, a protected bike lanes along Water Street, and there's opportunity to incorporate our multi-use trail with whatever happens in the future with the uh, uh, bike lanes along Water Street, whatever form those take in the future. Um, also included are some uh, bioswale and pollinator gardens. So again, just trying to create more natural and green spaces within the park mm -hmm. uh, for users, you know, versus rather than being a more structured and uh, hard lined set in stone uh, park space, these would be more, more naturalized uh, and allow people to kind of walk through gardens. There is a shelter and it located centrally between the um, basketball and pickleball and the play area. Uh, and this will be a green roof shelter, could be a green roof shelter, okay. um, which just essentially just means having small plants on top of the roof. Um, this whole plan I have all kind of came about in these past couple weeks as we are considering applying for uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources Open Space Land Acquisition and Development Grant, OSLAD. Uh, <laughs> which will be submitted uh, in the middle of next month. Um, and given the Kane County project, uh, the village staff saw this as an opportunity to uh, you know, go for that OSLAD grant because OSLAD looks favorably along um, towards uh, intergovernmental projects. So having the funding coming from the Kane County is kind of a point in the point in your all's favor for developing this park and receiving that grant. So with that, uh, that's kind of that's some broad strokes. If there are any questions. So just for clarity, mm -hmm. can you share, um, if you have clarity, um, which aspects of the riverfront portion of this would be funded by the Kane County? Absolutely. Um, the Kane County uh, access trail project would include the access, the, the paved access path 
down towards the river, the, the launch itself and the ramp down to the launch, and a uh, stone uh, debris barrier that would protect the launch. So that kind of reverse S-shaped uh, white sidewalk going down towards the river, the brown launch, and the uh, stone projecting out into the river just, just upstream of that launch. And then along with that would be any restoration uh, that would be necessary as the, uh, for, to restore for, from the development of that, uh, those elements. And we had talked about the fishing pier being an optional add-on. If there was funding available, is that still a possibility? Uh, we still need to kind of further develop some of the um, cost opinions uh, with the other four projects and trying to equitably distribute the, the funds for that Kane County project. Gotcha. Um, so I was going to get just a little bit more context to how we got to the, where we are today. Um, being that this will be an ADA accessible launch, there was really no nearby ADA accessible parking. So putting the parking here makes a lot of sense because if you want to use the ADA launch, you probably need to have easily accessible ADA parking. Um, and there's also, um, in addition to the regular angled parking spaces, there is a trailer parking space. If you're pulling some kind of trailer, you can have a longer space, which I think is a great amenity. Um, I look at this project in three phases. Um, the priority phase, phase one, would be the part where Kane County is providing the funding, uh, which is the launch. Um, obviously, the parking associated with that access launch is a priority as well, so that would be like priority two. Uh, priority three would be the park amenities themselves. Um, you know, Phil's been working with Dave to collaborate on sort of reimagining that park, and there's a lot of interesting elements on that, but we haven't had yet a lot of uh, public discussion or community feedback about um, what those park amenities could, would, or should be. Um, so as we sort of discuss this tonight, I think we should look at it with the lens of it's great that we're getting the funding for the launch and that's something that this board has said for years has been something we've wanted to add. So yeah. if, if there's agreement tonight to move forward on that, then you know that's full steam ahead. Um, we will try to submit for a grant to get funding for building out the parking and then the additional amenities along the river mm -hmm. and then the park itself, sort of reimagining that, you know, may take some more time to coalesce on a vision. Um, but for today, if we can get consensus on sort of phase one and phase two, that would be ideal. So can I just clarify, you're okay with us sort of just not like dealing with the park itself right now, like tonight? Okay, so it's just for phase one and phase two that we should be discussing. <coughs> okay, just wanted to clarify. I'd like to also add a quick comment on the flow of traffic around the park, if I can. So mm -hmm. this idea, um, obviously one-way flow northbound through the parking area, the idea is to prevent this from becoming a through street. It's for parking for the park and the river almost exclusively. Um, so motorists on Water Street coming from the south northbound, we would configure the intersection at water and second so that the natural flow of traffic would make a right onto second street up to Barrington turn left and as you can see on the map here um, we're proposing closing first street at Barrington and the idea there is kind of multi-purpose obviously it's for pedestrian safety is one aspect um, it's also to discourage anyone traveling through the we'll call it the parking area from continuing straight northbound. We, uh, we want to really discourage anyone in the parking area um, from traveling north on Water Street and or on First Street. The idea is to really emphasize this is a, a parking area and, and pedestrian safety. Um, so Water Street to Barrington and Barrington to Water on the north side of the park would essentially become for the most part a two-way street. So there would be stop stop signs, they're just not shown here. And, that would have to be engineered at some point, but um, 
what happens to First Street if it's closed? So First Street between North and Barrington would, there are, I believe, three driveways that um, are on First Street, be, just north of Barrington so it would Avenue. Stay there, it would just stop. At it would remain, it yes. So it would be closed at Barrington, yes. Can the streets around there actually support the amount of traffic that would have to reflow? Like Something north? we could certainly look at to see what kind of traffic currently is on First Street. I mean, this is block. an area where we have a lot of the really narrow roads that we're already talking about, not allowing parking certain times and things like that. And so I'm concerned about closing first, which is one of the larger roads mm -hmm. in that neighborhood for traffic, um, especially filtering out of the park. Um, I completely understand the pedestrian safety issue. It's just north is narrow, second is narrow. These other streets are more narrow than first. And I want to, before we, before we decide on that closure, I'd want to be sure that it makes sense to close it. I totally get not wanting people to go north on water, but maybe allowing them to either get out to first or go because at least letting them gets out, get out to first only makes them go one more block before they can get onto water, you know, as opposed to just having to like drive around the neighborhood for a little while to get back out there. Right, right. So that that's first is a little uh, closing. That's a little like I have questions. A little concerning. <laughs> sure, sure. And certainly something we can look further into and yeah. provide some additional information. Because there will be people who want to go north on water, you know, who want to go around the park, like who want to do that even from the park. And so if we kind of angle it so that, I don't know. I mean, that intersection is a mess. It's a K right now. Yeah. So I completely understand wanting to do something with it. I just don't know if closing first is the, um, and on a completely different note than closing streets and traffic, can we talk about the um, plantings and ornamental plantings along the river? You know, one quick thought yeah. on this. I mean, because this is just concept, one option is to keep First Street open one way southbound, perhaps. So that maintains the flow of traffic, but you can't continue northbound. Yeah, so I, I something all these different ideas yeah, can Yeah, tons of different ideas. I'm just not sure about closing it. I definitely want to talk to more people and really explore that. Because again, once if you're leaving the park or if you're going, well, I guess if you're going down Barrington, it's fine. But if you're leaving the park, literally your only option is to take a right onto Barrington, to go back to second, to then take a left onto north. You like have to do practically an entire rectangle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to get north on, on water. Yeah. So that's just, I mean, it's not like it's miles and miles of extra driving, but I have, picture people getting Why lost on turn North Street. Right in, right <laughs> what? Why can't you turn right yeah. out to North? Because it's a right on water. Like no, the, the park, but it's a right park. turn right only out of the park. Is this oh. a oh. right on, yeah, that's what oh, it says. Yeah, see yeah, so so leaving, so you're leaving the park. So you're closing yeah, first and it's a right turn so only on the very turn. So it'll go to get back right. to the water. I guess, you know, that is, you know, a good point though, but if people aren't using that parking lot as a through street, then they're taking, uh, you know, going around the park, they can turn left on Barrington from there and then go to Water Street North. Yes. Right. I'm just saying leaving the park. Yeah. Like leaving the park, it, you can't, you can't go north. Right. Is there a problem with making it oh, no, both, she, both left and right turn? The intent of making it a right turn only was to further discourage cut through traffic. Mm -hmm. But if we, I see. I think we can continue to evaluate whether or not it mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. to close that. I think there's a good point to be made that you could still make it a right only or a straight only and not make it, and just make it no left turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because you know, we, mm. can, we can have the engineer evaluate the amount of traffic that's currently on there and, and see what it would look like. So yeah. that's okay. not a decision we need to make today. We probably need to have that conversation. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So you were saying something about the one no, Oh, planting. sorry, <laughs> trees. Um, when I see ornamental, mm -hmm. I 
assume non-native plants? The intent would be to use native and native cultivars, but okay. in an ornamental structured way. Thank you. That's and very important on a riverfront. <laughs> yeah, being more selective in their, with their height and width and, and mm -hmm. sizing okay. versus naturalized planting where it's mm -hmm. seeding and letting it sure. do yes. its thing. It makes perfect sense. I appreciate the yeah. clarification. Mm -hmm. So these would be perennials. There's not yes. maintenance to have to replant them every year yeah. and sell seeding, reseeding, yeah. and all that kind of good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, two notes from a river aspect of this one. Um, after living on the river 20 years now, is the ice in the winter time can be really damaging to those piers. So that's just mm -hmm. going to be something to take into consideration. And then directly out from where you're talking about like the basketball court, there's two rock piles in the river. And I don't know if there's an old train trestle bridge or something, mm -hmm. but depending on how high the river is, they can be completely, you know, you can't see them. The river gets low right now. And it's actually you can see them out there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we've we seen those out there, and um, we've got room to get around those. Mm -hmm. uh, but obviously, when there's you know varying water depths, um, it's going to be up to the user to determine their you know, yeah. level of competency and comfort. Uh, another way to do it is put a buoy out there. Uh, that's, I mean, something that could be discussed with. Uh, yeah, that could be discussed with. Hey, my name is Tim Holloway. I'm the project manager working with Karen on the Fab Fox project. So, right. kind of aware of the stuff Ryan's doing. We work together, but managing separate projects. Um, so yeah, we are fully aware of the rock pilots out there. The, the floating pier. Um, this proposed would be inside of that rock pile. Um, we did talk to Erica and Phil. Um, the floating dock, it's not required, but preferred that the floating part is pulled out over the winter uh, to protect it from those ice dams. Ryan mentioned the large stone structure, um, sometimes called stream barbs, that are intended to deflect flow away from the bank and protect the bank. Um, so it should help protect the dock and the, that infrastructure that's installed. Um, also should help make that area maybe a little bit more tranquil for people getting in and out of their boats as it directs flow away from that bank. So uh, a couple different aspects there, but um, definitely we, we've looked at, and we all know the river floods, it also gets real low, it gets real high. Um, so we're taking that into consideration for the design of the dock. Although there is, let's say 10 foot fluctuation on the, the Fox from like low, low to it's flooding everywhere. It's really sort of where the way the dock will be designed, it's five foot down or five foot up. So it's not really, although it's 10 feet, it's not like the dock, well, the very tip of the dock is moving five feet, but from where it's anchored is only moving five foot up or down. So um, all, all very good points and all things. We are working with uh, different vendors that manufacture the different dock products and our engineers and We've had a survey crew out there that not only surveyed the land, but went out into the river. Um, we're working with a geotechnical engineer who's gonna provide, actually this side we didn't need to do borings because you had borings from um, when the water main was replaced. So all those different factors are being considered um, when we do this design. We're very aware of some of the challenges of the Fox River. Including the dam removal? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons this site was selected is that its water level does not, will not be affected by the dam. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. We received, or we talked to, had, so we received over two dozen different proposals. We ended up with five priority projects, and about half of those proposals were eliminated because if, when, and whole other discussion, but if, when the dams are removed, we can't spend <coughs> federal funds to put in docks that are going to be left high and dry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not, not a good use of federal funds. So the, this site was you know, safe from, uh, I think the term we used it was resilient to dam removal. So can I ask, since this is gonna be an investment on the county's part, it, does maintenance fall to us? The, the maintenance would fall to the individual villages or municipalities who own, own the, the location. And ownership. 
and ownership. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so Erica, what did you need from us again today? Just Direction. consensus on phase one. Do you have what you need to move forward for the King County portion? Uh, yes, as long as there's consensus on so moving forward with Please with let it. me clarify. Um, there will be an IGA coming from the county since they're funding improvements and that would also <laughs> specify that somebody other than the county is responsible for long-term maintenance. Um, this is the state's attorney the state's attorney's office is preparing that and sending it over. But for the, the Fab Fox project, there would be no financial requirement from the village. Um, no match, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. Just agree to let somebody else build it. And all five projects um, will be going out to bid under a county contract. Of course, we'll fill in another staff to coordinate here locally, but Again, yeah, no burden for you to hire an engineer to oversee it or inspect it. Um, um, taking care of all that, working with you know, the local partners to, to see it done. Um, that ideally would also be going out to bid about a month from now, because the funds have to be encumbered, not spent, but encumbered before <coughs> the end of the year, part of the federal grant. So construction wouldn't start until next year. I can't imagine the contract is going to start in February, but you never know. <laughs> strange these days. So, yeah, I think the, the kayak launch itself, phase one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all the yes. way up to what is currently the, the sidewalk, I guess, right there along the edge of the road, rather. It From the sidewalk down, down to the river. <coughs> we could, uh, portion, if we Actual build road. this, we could close down the uh, shady boat ramp that's right by the bridge. Yeah. Or that's not, <laughs> not, great, not great at all. Yeah. Not dangerous. We can move that too, I think. Oh. And I think the Mosai East Trail would be ideal to go all the way up yeah. along the whole yeah. for the length second, of the trail. For the secondary, for phase two. Of the river. Yeah. yeah. The park mm -hmm. is my biggest concern, and if we don't have to deal with that tonight, then mm -hmm. that's great. Well, I guess I do, I do question this foot multi-use trail because I mean what is it going to be Do, is it going to be paved is it going to be uh, we haven't gone we into gone materials on. yet um, I mean this is only a rock wrong segment mm -hmm. on that. what happens for the rest of there's uh, trail further discussion and uh, additional project work that needs to be done outside uh, I know Phil has mentioned um, uh, that there's you know additional work to be done for the uh, bike lanes um, along Water Street. So incorporating it into that project um, when that gets assessed and the engineering gets gets done for that. Yeah, so I think it's the Illinois the Transportation Enhancement Program grant that provides funding for bike lanes and sidewalk, basically pedestrian and bike infrastructure. So that is also open right now. There's a lot of grants out there right now, and I need to have six more fills in order to do all of the stuff that we want to do. But um, I would like to tie in some of these bicycle infrastructure projects into sort of a larger conversation about which are the priority areas so that this ITEP grant is, I think, every two years so that we can decide which ones are the priority projects when those funding cycles come along. Um, but I think incorporating this section now to then be incorporated into the larger scope is a good plan. And, and that way you're not causing additional disturbance like you know, right. uh, in the future. You know, disturb um, it now, one, d disturb it one time and then yeah. connect to it later. Um, the Hitchcock, you know, would they be able to help us with that grant writing on that since it's somewhat connected to the river front project? Because they, you know, one of their selling points was that they have a 97 some percent <laughs> success rate with their grants, so I would like to have them write some of them. <laughs> For this walkway, I would encourage, if you could, to avoid paver bricks. 
Oh, it's a high maintenance issue. Absolutely. Stamped concrete would be far preferable. Mm -hmm. Maybe pigmented, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, uh, and materials will be discussed okay. later on during the engineering yeah. and design development. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so I'm a thumbs up. Awesome. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Consensus so is just along the river there. Yes. Up so to where excited. that walk is. So for this. Okay. anybody have any questions, <laughs> comments? Has, has is um and we also have our, our representative from the park district. Do you see any issues with this plan or any concerns? I know part of this is probably more a little bit more down the road on your end of things, but this is the first I've heard of this. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Staff and I met with Erica and Phil uh, last year, and they introduced this. Mm -hmm. We want to. I know my board will fully support uh, expanding the park and for us to maintain it. So we're excited as well. Okay. And some of the ideas in the park, um, I like. The pickleball has grown tremendously, and within the two rec centers, we have seven courts total. Not enough. And outdoor courts, we have none, but we are looking to build some here this year, and it's in our budget. Uh, so the idea of one pickleball court's probably good because with houses around, mm -hmm. if you have six, eight of them, it gets really loud. Mm -hmm. I don't see that being a problem in the way they, they station or the way they located it. So yes, we're very supportive. I talked with my board president about this last week after Phil and I talked, and I'm sure our board will fully support right. any expansion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No, thanks, Rob. Thank Erica, this is, I, I'm sorry, sorry. Phase, does the second phase of this that we're approving tonight include the parking lot, or is it just to the eight foot path? Just to the I mean, for today, we just need to make sure everybody is uh, fully supporting the access, the ADA pier, and the, the access to it. But. Um, if you have any other comments on the parking no, area? I don't. I mean, uh, actually, uh, my comment would be that I like it. So. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I'm just curious if that's what we're starting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I still need to work on identifying funding for that portion. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got some good ideas. Good. So. Okay. Great. Hope so. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank else? you. Yes. Your questions, comments? Love it. Thank, thank you. you. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, that's going to take us to item C then. If we could have a motion for that. <clears throat> I move to approve a resolution waiving bidding and authorizing the village administrator to execute an agreement with Testing Services Corporation, 360 South Main Place, Carroll Stream, Illinois, 60188, in the amount not to exceed $88,000 for soil, steel, and concrete testing services at the parking garage project site. Second. Okay, questions, comments? Um, I have a question. I do too. Why do we call this, uh, you know, why do we say that this is, you know, waiving the bidding when we got three bids? I don't know, how does that? Village attorney, would you like to weigh in or shall I answer? Well, you didn't put it out for we need to do an RFP. Oh. So okay. Should we do that? Gotcha. So I'm struggling with the idea of the misstep here. McHugh, this is not new to them. I already discussed this with Erica. This is something that I would have liked to have seen be presented to us up front. Um, simply because it, it's not an add-on. It's not a change order but now it's an $80,000 hit. Um, it, of course, begs the question of how many more down the line we're going to see. We're not going to 86 this project because of an $80,000 unforeseen expense, but how many will we see? That's my, my point. And the idea that, well, we had a phase one and phase two soil test, so I don't really see that soil is a big issue in this, but steel and concrete, certainly McHugh is a big enough company to know whether or not the vendors that they use for materials are providing materials that are sound, that are meant to do what they're supposed to do. The strength, the tensile strength of concrete is supposed to be whatever it should be to accommodate the weight of a parking deck. The steel needs to be as strong as it needs to be. These are things they ought to know already, and I don't know how it is that they're going to test this 
and not delay the project. And what happens if it does? And my thought isn't so much today, tomorrow, but it's 10 or 15 years down the road. If all of a sudden a big chunk of concrete falls from the roof of this thing and lands on a car, McHugh is going to be pointing to um, you know, the, the testing services company here, and testing service is going to be pointing to McHugh. You know, in the meantime, we're going to end up with a parking facility that can't be used. Um, I would like to know that we have some sort of protection down the line that f for this we're guaranteed of a certain quality and is there a bond that needs to be taken out to protect the village of East Dundee in the meantime? I don't know, but I think there should be. Is there a representative from TSC here tonight? There is. Okay. If you don't mind, uh, introducing yourself to the podium. Okay. Hi there. I cannot answer on McHugh's behalf. I have no <laughs> idea what happened there. Um, but what's your question? Well, my question is, is that how long is it going to take to test steel and concrete? How is it going to be done? And, I mean, does the concrete that you're going to be testing need to be cured over a year period, a five-year period? Does the, the structural integrity of these materials decline over time, which likely it would? But what is... Basically, what do we get for our eighty thousand dollars? <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we're going to follow. You guys have a specification book on testing. It's kind of like the rule book we have to follow, and it requires us to follow the ASTM's and the American Concrete Institute um, for testing for concrete and steel. Um, we're going to be on site pretty much full time, sampling the concrete that day. Um, you only wait 28 days, and then you test the cylinders for strength. After 28 days, concrete producers say at 28 days it should be 5,000. And then we're going to test it in our lab. Our lab is federally and state approved. Um, and we give the results, say, hey, you got your concrete? It's, it's well over 5,000. or It's not up at 5,000. Which then the engineers will then take steps to further either test or redesign the building. Um, so that's how. It, it doesn't take five years, no. Um, I don't know, anything more than that. Well, I mean, is concrete going to be poured prior to it being tested? During, During. The testing. Yeah. And what in the event happens that you find a flaw or a problem with the mix, the, like I say, the structural right. integrity of that concrete after it's been poured? Who takes on the cost of removing that faulty concrete and redoing it. Your concrete producer, probably. Yeah. They, the concrete pourer is making promises so let's say about they're, the quality they're pouring. of their product. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying yeah. is if he's going to check against what they promise, yeah. and if it doesn't meet that, then they have to replace it. Who's As it's coming out of the truck, we're testing it. Yeah. If yeah. there's a problem right there, because there are specs for that mix, air content, slump, temperature. If there's problems right there, we notify them right away. That truck is either rejected mm -hmm. or sent back to the plant or whatever they want to do with it. So is this common um, practice that it's tested during the pouring? So this is, is this is a common, common practice? Yeah. What? That it's tested during the pouring? So this isn't yes. anything out of the ordinary? Every job. Or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every yeah. IDOT job, every all I need to know. private job. Yeah. So, so I can I can see this. My brother does this for a living too, so I'm I'm a little bit more familiar. It is it's standard practice. It's like an insurance agency. It's like an insurance policy. I kind of say we're the UL. Yeah. On your toaster. And, that's, and that's, that, that's what we are for construction. And that the 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 materials that are coming into the project are what they have promised to say they are. There mm -hmm. are problems. There aren't any, any kind of inconsistencies. And <coughs> honestly, if we're sending. Mm -hmm spending six million dollars on this and we are testing the primary materials that need to go into it, I don't want McHugh to do it. I want an independent testing service to be doing that. Um, and so as, as much as I had your uh, same initial, you know, like why wasn't this, you know, part of the bigger budget or, or whatever, um, it, 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 totally makes sense and I'm glad that we're going down this path. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree. agree that to a degree that it, it's better to have more information than, than less. However, what I'm concerned about is down the line. Mm -hmm. You know, you can tell me that it's okay today. What if it isn't okay tomorrow? Where does that put the Village Beast on deep? You know, I mean, where does that put, I mean, from a liability standpoint, if I have a chunk of concrete falling down on somebody, <coughs> we got problems. And so even though you could tell me today that you take your slump test, you time it, and it spreads at a uniform rate, I don't know well, that. The, we we you know, know what our liability is. Our lawyer so can tell us you, what our liability is. your contract has protections against that. Okay. Have, and also. They have to provide a bond to the village. Who does? <coughs> Okay, and I don't know who it is that you want to do this that will be able to guarantee I'm from all of eternity that this building will never fall down. No, I'm not asking for I mean, this you're not going to like say I can't eat an apple because eventually it's going to be a core. Like we just, you, you know, I'm I mean, not that's, saying that either. All but I'm doing is is proposing the what ifs, the question. It's like but, zero to know, sixty, though. You know, so I mean, these are important things to consider. That's all I'm asking the board to do is to consider them. Well, I think testing. Is the board considering it? Because it's giving us, we're, we're doing more. We're doing our due diligence. We're, this is more checks. I completely agree. I'm not a fan of another 90 grand for the parking garage that is already very expensive. But doing the testing is vital as a step in this process to make sure that we're doing the right thing. I, I agree. So. Absolutely, I agree that the testing and making sure that the material is to the standards of what it's <coughs> being asked to accomplish is 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 done. However, I just want to make sure yeah. that we have assurances well, I that think anyone in the project has a liability stake from your structural engineer, yeah. mm -hmm. your civil engineers. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have our own stakes in what is done. My main concern is what's coming out of that truck and going in the forms. Mm -hmm. And if I see an issue, right away we notify. And the soil. Because you're my client. Right? And the soil. And, and the soil is, yes, the own. There's no asphalt right now. Mm -hmm. And um, we notify McHugh right on site, whoever their field representative is. We notify the producer if it's Prairie or Zinga. It's Prairie. 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 Okay. <clears throat> so they notify right away. Their, their plant QC department is notified and they'll take action. So okay. everybody is notified and that's my responsibility. Um, the product would be uh, the concrete producer, the design is the structural engineer, and so forth. So everybody will have a stake at some point. Okay. Okay. Great. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank Frank. you. Tracy Sauter? Yes. Tracy Saviano? Yes. Tracy Triber? Yes. Tracy Kunze? Yes. Trustee Maloney? Yes. And Trustee Britton? Yes. Okay, that'll take us to item D. There was a question or a request to table this one. Is that still of interest? Postpone. Or postpone, mm -hmm. not the table. Budget? I'm sorry? Yeah, because yeah. We, this is a long meeting In and we still have long time, discussion. Oh, okay. So, I was asking if we can do that. I will just send out the regular. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then that'll take us to item E. Oh, we, need to, oh. Is it, we don't have to make a motion. We don't have to make a motion for it. So. <laughs> yeah. okay. so the next one is just a direction. So the village board directing uh, re direction rather regarding the status of current video gaming moratorium and a review on the various policy options. This one was done from last year. I think it's going to end is it, is it September 1st. Or? I believe it's. O end of nope. October, November seventh, right? November seventh. November 7th. November 7th. Yeah, it's in the packet. Right, right in the September. <laughs> okay, so because it was okay, well, it was a year. Uh, as I recall, the idea behind the moratorium was we had some oddball requests for gaming, uh, in addition to additional parlors, which uh, we weren't comfortable with. There was some strange requests putting gaming in liquor stores and so forth. Um, so instead what we did was we put in a, a moratorium on this. My suggestion to with discussions with Erica was just to put into ordinance um, prohibiting gaming except for bars and restaurants. We can leave what the moratorium was doing in place, codify it with an ordinance, and then allow 
you know, bars and restaurants, which we currently allow throughout the town to continue to do that, to continue to operate. We also have a gaming cafe. We do, and those would be in. No, 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 no. Just further ones. Those are there, so there's really so essentially you want to that. You want to ban gas stations yeah. and convenience stores. Those are there too. And so yeah, I mean it would be. Um, those but are, what are there considered grandfathered, if you will. No, I know. But going but forth, going. What forward. is your proposal as far as which type of establishment? Just bars and restaurants. So you wouldn't allow another gaming game cafe. Ever. Correct. And that was, that was the basis of the idea of the moratorium anyway, because if, as I recall, and correct me if I'm wrong, we really didn't have a direction at the time, um, except for a, you know, a, 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 a kind of a consensus, if you would, that we didn't want it to go into. So, I guess my, so yeah, I guess my question then would be, can we legally do that? Can we legally say no truck stops? Because right now truck stops under state law don't have a restriction. So can we then say no more? I'll have to look at the state statute to see if there is preemption. If not, then you cut it. Okay. So the other, the other part of this is, I think, with the moratorium, there are a lot of policy options that we can put into place. I think along those lines, saying no more gaming cafes or, so, or something like that, if, it's, if that's even legal. Um, but. I think there are other policy options we can look at as well as far as how many machines in the establishments, how many machines in a certain square area, you know, things like that where we do have in place the square footage mm -hmm. requirement. We did that um, before. I think that there's a lot of, you know, discussion on do we want to cap licenses? Do we want to cap machines? Do we want to try to roll back? like to a certain number, um, we're at 126 right now. Mm -hmm. We have a huge amount. And if you look back at the data, adding more machines does not mean we make more money or the machines make more money. Mm -hmm. The new machines don't make, on average, yes. video gaming terminals, the, the amount each terminal makes in town on average, month to month, has gone down the more machines we add. So that's, you know, that's, we, it, I, I personally feel like if we can get to a sweet spot, you know, that would be great. I don't at all think that we should stop letting machines in town. I don't think that we should go to businesses that currently have them and say, you have to give us two. <laughs> but I think that as a board, we can discuss what do we have now? Where do we want to go? What makes the most sense? And how do we go about getting there? You know, the places that have them right now, they're not grandfathered in. So if ownership changes, we apply new rules. Like any new rule that we decide today, the next meeting, at any point, new, you know, does ever, like businesses that have however many machines right now, they keep them. But if ownership changes, they have to comply. Like, what do we, what do we as a board want? What do we want to see gaming look like in our community? We have saturation in the downtown area. Do we want to keep that saturation? You know, without really negatively impacting new businesses or taking away from existing businesses. You know, how do we kind of strike that balance? So. Yeah, the, I, I just <coughs> want to bring up another point that nobody's discussed yet, which was another big driver, at least for me, and that um, I believe our administrator pulled up, and then um, Caleb uh, did a, a great job on um, on illustrating on page 319 of your um, of the packet, which is the number of video gaming terminals per capita. We have one gaming terminal for every 25 people that live in this village. That's insane when you can, and it's 10 times, the next closest one is, is, is one in, a, in, in 250 people per capita. So I feel like we're way oversaturated um, with this. And I would honestly prefer to, calm down the amount of 
terminals that are in the downtown area, I'm fine with it at truck stops. I'm fine with it at gas stations. I'm fine with it in these other, if they, if they fulfill the other areas. But if another restaurant has to come in and say that they have to have in, in, in this system, they, they have to have gaming terminals in order to succeed, I, I think they need to rethink their, their business model. There are other, um, I think you mentioned, um, who does, who's the only person that doesn't have gaming terminals that's a restaurant in the Tequila Valley? Tequila Valley. Tequila Valley. Who? Tequila Valley. Tequila Valley oh, Mockingbird. and Mockingbird. Mockingbird. Mockingbird wasn't mentioned in that recap, and they don't have them. And Mockingbird is doing great, and they're expanding their business because guess what? It provides a nice environment for people who don't want to have to listen or hear or see all the lights and the sounds and everything else that are in, in those areas, even though they might be, you know, put off to the side, you still have you still have to experience them and the noise. So and the distance social, just to throw that. And distance yeah. social, yeah, doesn't have it either. So there are there are very successful businesses in in this village that don't have the gaming terminals that have a, a, a business plan and a business model that allows them to grow, expand, and do a great things within the village without having to have the video gaming terminals. And now I've said my piece. <laughs> well, I think that's an interesting point because I hadn't thought of this until Caleb brought it up in his research that a lot of communities do that six month waiting period. So mm -hmm. you open your doors, you're in operation for six months, you sort of prove your business model and then you apply for your gaming terminal if you want to have it. Yeah, and I'm, honestly, I would even go go further, give them a year because, you know, people are going to, it takes a while to start up a business and get it going and get it functioning properly and getting, I mean, many business, many like restaurants or other businesses go out of, restaurants in particular will go out of business within the first year because they don't have a good business model, because they don't have the proper um, uh, management in place to be able to manage that kind of business because it's so romantic and it draws so many people that don't really know what they're doing. Um, fortunately, we've had a lot of really great people that do know what they're doing that have come to this village. So that's 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 my big concern. Um, I don't, um, you know, Tequila Vals came into this this village knowing that we didn't have have um, that there was a moratorium and um, and. At, We've been seeing so many other business plans from people, you know, saying that they want to have video gaming. Well, yeah. I have no problem with that kind of logic or point. It just, for me, I think it would have been helpful if we had applied it sooner. Um, if you recall the the marathon, uh, um, it's Exxon now, I think it is, right across from Dairy Queen. I recall when he came in, that proprietor. He said, in order for me to be able to, to stay in business, in order to be able to compete, I have to have gaming. And we gave it to him. And I didn't understand it, really, because what does gaming have to do with selling gas? You know, it didn't make any sense. But, um, but it's a good point. You know, I mean, if you are going to rely on gaming to make your, your numbers, then you probably need to rethink your, your business model, maybe, or, um, or you know, because what, is, what one has to do with the other, I don't know. But um, I think it's going to be met with some resistance, so we need to at least, you know, prep ourselves to that. Well, I've got some comments I'd yeah. like to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, um, the data you brought up, I do appreciate it, but it's not longitudinal data. And c costs and increases, like things have gone up. In, in the economy and so it is a luxury thing I don't think people are paying as much as they did a couple of years ago so I think the data could potentially be skewed a little bit from that so that's just something that I want to bring up number one number two I do have an issue like saying like if I put all this money invested into a restaurant that you're gonna tell me what I want or can and cannot have like is someone to tell me what type of like margaritas to sell so if my goal when I build a restaurant is I also would like gaming and if people don't like it, they can choose not to go to the establishment, mm -hmm. establishment and it'll work itself out. Um, the per capita thing, we're 
what residential, 70% commercial. So the numbers are gonna be skewed anyway when it comes to businesses. We have way more restaurants and bars than a lot of places do. So some of these things are like, yes, I see it and it could look shocking, but when you really look at all the variables, it's not as shocking to me. I and and I also just, I am not like a, I'm not a big governmental oversight person. Mm -hmm. I'm like, go ahead, you want some games? Have some games. <laughs> I you know, like, I, I, it's just not a hill I'm going to die on. Yeah. I don't mind some regulations, but yeah. I don't like telling people what to do when they invested a crap ton of money to build the business the way they want to. I, I think there's a I little agree. bit of a balance. I, I, do think, I do think that what we need to come up with are the guardrails. Six right? months waiting period, that's all we should do. In my six months with the square footage. We don't need six games when it takes up 90% okay of the car space. We have a square footage already in place. <laughs> that's already that's in fine. place. Like, I'm okay with the square that's footage That's in place, but have. what I would like to say is if the business switch is over, they have to abide by new rules. Oh, yeah. Because that's the thing. Like, we've got a bunch of businesses that have six games and it takes up 90% of their bar. Mm -hmm. And that's... And that's where I'm a little rough. Yeah, absolutely. It turns over. Can now we, you follow the new well, regulations. Can we also absolutely. talk about or incentivize or discuss in some way businesses looking at their numbers and saying, hey, I, do, I don't actually need this one machine? Like, mm -hmm. you know, incentivize reduction um, <coughs> to get us closer to that sweet spot. I do, like, the numbers could be skewed. Um, I did look 20, 2022, 2023, 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked, I mean, I looked like May, 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 June, June, June. So it's not like, well, yeah, February's garbage and May yeah, is yeah. fantastic, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's, I try to look at the same point and, in time. And the numbers just aren't, we're not making more. We might make $500 more across 120 machines. Yes. yes. But we're not but I, making But you still don't thousands. know all the variables that play into that. That's why I'm like, I can't we don't. base the decision. But you have to, if we're going to look at numbers, if we're, gonna, if we're going to accept any data, you mm -hmm. have to accept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there will be variables. I mean, so I like the idea of some guardrails. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of having new, like, any new machines have to meet the standards that we put in. Um, square footage stuff, all that good stuff. Could we look at ways of saying, can you tuck it in a corner? Can you, mm -hmm. like for new, for new, for existing businesses when they switch over, can we not have it in the front window? I love what Cobb's has. I love that little nook. nook. <laughs> the um, gaming nook. The only thing I'll say about that is that if we're going to impose a year waiting period or something like that, you're asking businesses to create a room for a machine that they don't have for a year and they never get. You know? That's true. I was actually thinking more of the some of the existing ones that are just like in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. You know, that's I mean, the... You know, I think that that is what uh, Trish is saying. If you go into a business and it has a machine and you don't like to see it, then mm -hmm. you just gotta like... And the other thing is, business. a lot of those places probably wouldn't make the square footage. I'm like trying to think through everything. They probably wouldn't meet the square footage requirements anyway. So if they switched ownership, they'd have to sw they'd have to reduce the number of machines. And, well, and so that's a good point too. And, and it doesn't yeah. transfer. It doesn't transfer with mm -hmm. the ownership right. of the business. I do so want to make sure that if they have one person sticking around for like a five person ownership thing, that yeah. there's a reapplication and they have to like, yeah. like I don't want like, it's like a liquor license. If you're the majority right. shareholder and you're not the old majority shareholder, you have to reapply. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, one uh, thing to consider <laughs> is that it's a brand thing for our town as well. We're trying to become the culinary district, and it has actually become that. And there are very competitive restaurants and bars that are opening up, and we want the best ones to compete here. And uh, there's a certain point when we become more of a gambling town and the quality of the food and the experience isn't uh, as valuable like when a bank of gaming terminals can make you an easy 30 40 grand a month when you're not even trying with your food or your drinks then you're kind of incentivizing something different for the business to focus on um, and that might be why most of these towns have much more restrictions. It's not because they don't like businesses. It's 
because they're trying to bring about the right kind of businesses to compete with other towns. So I'm not trying to get rid of them all, but there is, um, like asking around, there are a lot of people who, uh, on Facebook I put a post up asking, do you want it or not want it? Um, not trying to lead people, but it does seem like there are a lot of people saying, we want a lot less of them, we can't get seats anymore, um, there's so many spots dedicated to gambling, um, and I don't blame, like if we have a restaurant that should go out of business, uh, because they're not trying anymore with their food. I'm not saying that I'm pointing at any one of them. But if you have video gaming terminals, you can just stay open forever because you don't really need to try. So you want a balance of give some incentive with the video gaming terminals, but not let it become the focus of the business, like the gaming cafes. Right. So limiting them on a restaurant does make some sense, and I don't see it as just punitive attacking business. Yeah, I guess we don't want gaming cafes that serve food, right? You know, that's like I'm okay with no gaming cafes in the downtown. Right, area. but the, like and I get that, I, and I like yeah. that. Yeah. I like I like no gaming cafes in the downtown. But I think to Andy's point, we don't want we don't want our restaurants to turn into gaming cafes that are right. solely serve. And I think the six month rule will help that some. I I don't know if it's going to do everything, but at least you have to prove that your business is viable in the first place without gaming to support. Were the square footage requirements developed in-house or did we get that from state guidelines or county or anything? There are ours, I think. Did we put, did we put them together? I, the square footage requirements, I think that we, we, we did those. We, I mean, one thing I think we can do is visit to make sure that there's compliance. Well, the thing is there are enough businesses grandfathered in. Well, that already had gaming before we put the square footage requirement mm -hmm. in place. And like I said, I'm not, you know, I don't plan to go up to existing businesses and be like, you've had your games for 10 years. We just did this. Give them back. Yeah. But, <laughs> but if there was a way to incentivize them, like, hey, we'll yeah. do something yeah. for you if you give I us. I liked some of those ideas in the packet yeah, of incentivizing and inci like to release a, a, a video game terminal but also incentivizing the restaurants that decide we're not gonna have it. Yeah. Uh, because we are, we could increase the fees and match um, some of the, yeah. o the other towns. I think that's like a good even idea if we too. charged uh, $5,000 a year on a machine that makes them 30 grand a month, it's still very, very worth it for them to pay mm -hmm. that fee. And maybe that goes into a bank that creates kind of like the facade program that Erica mentioned, uh, maybe mm -hmm. having a program um, commit to video gaming free and there's incentives that maybe are paid for with video gaming terminal fees uh, so it's not like it goes to us it's just trying to spread out and equalize between the businesses um, and create maybe a higher percentage of restaurants that create that experience for people that they're asking for is we don't want tons of video game terminals in the restaurant yeah so I have a question for the attorney would an establishment that has, say, eight games that only has room for six, claim that it's a legal nonconformance? If they were, you're talking about after you've already passed that ordinance that amounted based on square footage? Correct. Or would we retire I mean, yearly? I mean, they could try. We've I, been slapped with that one a couple times. It's, a, it's so. a licensing issue, it's not a zoning issue. So if the village decides it wants to change, it's fine. But licensings are based on zone, aren't they? Yeah, I think we grandfathered in any existing. Yeah, when we, when we implemented the square footage requirements, existing businesses were grandfathered in. So we're not applying those square footage requirements to businesses that had games before the uh, date of the implementation. Then the yeah, they probably argue that it's a right that Existing if the village wants to take away their privilege or license, and would they prevail? Do we want to fight that fight? I don't think that's <laughs> nobody here is talking about taking away. I don't know. I'm just saying because yeah. I know there are there are some. I mean, we're talking about there's no how desire to do there's that. So much noise and, and disruption and seats that are being like, taken up by yeah. the games. If we were to revisit no. compliance <laughs> and found establishments to be out of compliance. Could that be posed as an argument? If they're out of compliance, then yeah, they could be 
cited it and they can be brought before. That would be our position. But would theirs be that it's legally non conforming? Maybe, but if they're not legal non conforming and they were filing the square footage after that, but Right, but we again. Like, I want to speak about this moving forward, not anything yeah. punitive on something that yeah. exists. Like I, I'm not, I don't want to right. create enemies with our businesses. Like yeah. that's yeah. no desire for that. Theoretically, the village can pass an ordinance saying video games is not allowed. Period. And no more from a No. Just talking what ifs. So thank you. Um. I was pretty surprised by how low our fee is in comparison yeah. to other places and now have a much better idea why we are the gaming people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I picked up on the concept that was talked about, about increasing that fee and then using that fee as some sort of incentive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we can think about incorporating that into the budget this fall. Mm -hmm. Does it? Does it make sense, you know, I like what Andy did um, with kind of just putting a questionnaire out there, is that, does it make sense for us to do a survey ourselves from a website that, you know, if you have to say you're an East Dundee res resident or not, and then, you know, what's your feeling about the gaming terminals? Do we have too many? Do we have too few in the different areas? That's um, is that opening it up to, I mean, we're here to serve the residents um, as well, and you know, there's places I'm I'm, I'm not interested in going to because they're just gonna I know they're gonna be just too too loud. Even though I used to enjoy going and eating at those same places before they were in there. Um, so um, we do have a volume. We have a volume it's, thing. If the you're not it's, it's lights too. And oh it's, yeah, the lights it, are a thing. I'll, I'll tell you it's. For example, mm -hmm. and here's the thing about the space and everything else, and I agree with you, Tricia, I don't want to start rolling back on people that have already been approved that have had them forever, but here's like, like a, a good example with the space requirements, you know, for somebody going forward. Um, you know, so if, if um, and, and because, you know, it's right there when you walk in, right in the front, it's right up against, you know, half, you know a third of the bar, um, and the rest of that area is very small for, for, for tables, for eating, for, you know, for um, just hanging out. Um, but they also have the upstairs. Um, so, you know, when we're calculating, you know, s the square footage, it needs to be by floor. They can't take the square footage of both the top floor and the bottom floor, put it together, and then mm -hmm. say, that this space. is how many I am allowed because of my whole space. Mm -hmm. um, there's just practical, some practical matters like that. And that's probably like just the first example that comes off, my, off the top of my head with how much it's really, really encroaching on the space of what that business used to have. Or was for, meant to be. Hmm? Or was meant to be. Yeah. yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. All right, so just to recap, so we can formulate this into something that we can bring back to you. Uh, no gaming cafes in the downtown. Mm -hmm. Gaming licenses do not transfer. Any ownership change must reapply. Mm -hmm. Evaluate the designated area and see if it, we can put any additional guardrails around making it so that it's not sort of front and center. Um, looking at increasing the fees, potentially using increasing fees for incentives, six month waiting period, and then square footage by floor. Which, yeah. Fair. That sounds that fair sounds to come back with. Yeah. Okay. From we'll somewhere in the middle. Okay. Okay. Anything else? No? Wonderful. That'll take us to our next item, which is again a discussion. So this is the Village Board discussion and direction of an ordinance amending the Village Code Section 3701 and Chapters 113 and 120 concerning food trucks. Mm -hmm. So Erica, would you like to open this one up? Sure. So we've had a uh, continued discussion about this and the Community Events and Depot Committee discussed it again recently. And we've sort of gone back and forth on which way we want to go. Well, bless you. <laughs> I think the memo accurately reflects the committee's 
recommendation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. now we would like to understand if the full board is on board with that recommendation. Yeah. And so, one of the things um, I've been working on with Franco, uh, Franco, um, and uh, Mark um, had also brought forward when we talked about this last was that we have food trucks in East Dundee that aren't regulated, that are out um, along one of the auto um, dealerships and at Gat Guns, Gat Guns and also in the park trucking, uh, truck parking behind Palumbo and that kind of thing. Oh, and so, the mall area too, right well, there. yeah, no manchas until they get their water heaters up and yeah. going and, and the health department, King County Health Department approves everything. Um, so they're in, they're in the village already, and they're completely unregulated. Un, um, uh, and so I'm just concerned about the, I want to make sure um, that we address the areas that have been found by the food trucks and that are already being used by the food trucks and that, um, and that we make sure that they are have proper protocols for, you know, te te holding temperature, um, all of the sanitation, and that they're serving safe food. Mm -hmm. And that's my main concern um, with with trying to bring this forward. Um, this does not include anything about downtown at all. Um, there were the four there were the four different um, points. Um, per, where it's permitted, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. Um, food trucks are only permitted on public roads or during events with um, village approval. Food trucks are permitted on private property with permission of the property owner and are permitted to sell to the property owner's private guests. And I'm imagining at this point that the ones at Gat Guns and the ones at this auto at the auto dealer and the ones behind Palumbo are not sending out invitations and they are not their guests. These are just people from you know, driving down 25 going, oh, I want some elote. Safe assumption. Mm -hmm. So how do we get that in here? I would rather have them in a in a parking lot with the permission of the owner. Um, you know, and if it's if it's something that can handle why was it why was it that specific verbiage? Was that just pulled over from previous? I think that is so that the property owner who's hosting the food truck, say in the case of Get Guns, mm -hmm. the primary business of Get Guns is to sell merchandise. Mm -hmm. The primary business isn't to, you know, host a food truck and bring people in right. for that food truck. So by saying that the food truck is only going to serve the guests of that property, we'd like to limit it to being an accessory use and not like saying we're going to have a food truck fest on Get Guns property and we're going to invite 12 food trucks and there's going to be, you know, this every weekend thing. So I think that was the intent, but you can add clarity if you have any more. comments on why we would put yeah. food truck yeah, serving to private guests. Yeah. Okay. And does this also give, for instance, if there's a food truck in their parking lot and there are people that are coming, you know, driving down 25 up to Carpentersville or down to Elgin um, that say, oh, well, hey, I want to pick this up. I'm hungry. Um, but then instead they decide to stay all afternoon and party and do whatever they want to do on that public property then they have or that private property then they have the right to say hey. no. Yeah, and the idea behind this too is more like, you know, if you're a corporate business, let's say and you're doing like a corporate event for your employees, mm -hmm. saying, you know, what special treats they are when they food truck home and it launches on us. Mm -hmm. That type of situation, not not the situation you're describing, and I think mm -hmm. then the, the private property owner will have to regulate that and say, you know, can't stay here all day. 
right. that, you know, this isn't the primary purpose of the business. Well, are we going to, would we rely on the property owner then to regulate it? Because I th my thought is, is that, yeah, while it may be private property and the food truck is on there, as Kathleen mentioned, they're catering to the general public, which certainly then falls under our jurisdiction because Even on not, private property? we don't know what they're doing, how they're doing it, or when. And I think we need no, to. No, it, it, it would be a challenge, and it would be, you have to, you know, see a crowd lining up in a business of primary purpose in that food trucks. You have to send Chris or the inspector over and say, what's going on here? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Why, why do we need this? Uh, verbiage about the guests of the property owner wouldn't that be up to the property owner to regulate that really mm -hmm. if they see a line of people out there that aren't coming to get guns they can just go out there and say we don't want all these people here why why do we need to have anything to do with that so i don't understand what if they don't need what i guess what if you know think about the what ifs if the owner of get guns were to go out to the food truck operator and say we need you to move on well in the first place Get Guns is probably the ones that invited them. Yeah. So obviously they enjoy having yeah. that there. Yeah. So, so I don't understand. Trespassing otherwise, and yeah, they exactly. can't enforce that. I, I, I just don't understand what this even means, to be honest with you. And the auto Only dealers. guests of the property owner, and not the general public. I mean, I don't know what that means. How If somebody is driving by Route 25 and they see a food truck, and they go into Get Guns and get a taco, I don't understand why we would have a problem with yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's when every every establishment in the town decides to take that route. Take what route? To allow a food truck in there. I mean, there has to be some control over it. Otherwise, we could. Well, that's what we're trying to actually do. Right. Is put well, some control. We can't control do it now because we but, don't have anything. Right. Uh, but we I, can't do anything I don't want to make something that doesn't make sense. But we're going to have a permit and, and like we're going to enforce the King County Health Department. So if they want to have a food truck, I don't see why that matters. Like on public land, I get it. We said no, we don't want that. This but is private. This is private land if they want to have a food truck. Like, are they going to check and make sure that you looked at guns before you get the taco? <laughs> or you could have the taco if you well, at least and are and thinking about a gun. <laughs> and that car dealership is, has it there on Sundays when they're closed. Because right. they have no business there. So it's just a vacant parking lot for them. So I it's... Are we yeah. going to regulate what people can do on their own pro private property? Wow. So what a business I, can do on their private property. One private suggestion property. I would add is oh. perhaps we should, because again, are we, what, are, what are we trying to achieve here? Do we want to have a food truck at every at, at any business more than once a week? Maybe you do, and that's fine. But if you want to say okay, get guns, you have this food truck, but I'd prefer if you only did it once or twice a week versus every day of the week, or twice mm -hmm. a month or four times a month, so that maybe people would patronize other businesses in town. I think that's a good incentive or a good control to have so that you can have a balance. And maybe people would, instead of going to the food truck every day, go out and check out East Endy restaurants. So there is an argument to be made to to having some kind of regulation mm -hmm. in place that may limit guardrails often. Guardrails. Guardrails. Well, I, 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 I guess I'm an advocate to Erica's point. If you had, I guess we're using Gat Guns as an example, if Gat Guns had a food truck seven days a week, you know, for every day that they're in operation, all, all hours, what's to say that that food truck hasn't cut a deal with Gat Guns to say we're going to give you a kickback for letting us be here? Now it's not a guns business, it's a food truck business. Yeah, so just yeah. essentially so I, see, I, I, I understand that. Understand yeah, I see that point. Well, here's one thought. Chief, can I ask you a question? How many, how many calls have we gotten to uh, for the food truck at Gat Guns for problems? No. No, there was so one. There was one in your police report. <laughs> at Gat Guns for the food truck? Yeah. I don't remember that. Well, so what if, I guess I just don't understand what we're trying to <laughs> prevent here. I mean, what I, I, I get saying we don't want it in the downtown. Fine. <laughs> We've had this fight so many times. That, but if they're doing something on Route 25, that's not taking business from the downtown, I don't think. But um, it's also a, a vision of what do we 
want in the village. So for example, Palumbo's Truck Park, there's 3,000 trucks out there every day. If they have food trucks out there seven days a week, they're never going to fill in those restaurants in that retail building that mm -hmm. they build mm -hmm. because they've got another option. So some kind of right size balance mm -hmm. where it's a nice amenity, but it's not an omnipresent thing could be helpful. Weekends? But again, I, I don't know that we have a huge problem right now, but maybe we will someday. Maybe, but we do have this set up that if we did have a problem, we could address it by pulling our lights. We could do this and then amend it if need be based on what's happening, but this is a good starting point. Kelly, what happens if somebody frequents a food truck, gets sick, and decides to sue the village? Can we? I mean, I is there any liability? I would say anybody can sue the village for any reason. Which we have <laughs> seen. Whether it's a lawsuit or not, it's another story. Um, so I think, I think you're better off regulating Big than not. Because well, that's what we're trying to do. You don't want to turn a blind eye to food being sold in the village, right? Because we don't know how it's prepared or if someone's washing their hands or has at all you know, right temperatures. And it's better to try to regulate it than not regulate it, right? Yeah. Okay, so in the event somebody does, I mean, whether they purvey or not is not the question, but they could name the village in a suit. I mean, the village has tort immunity on, on most of these types of issues. However, <coughs> the, they're here, so I'm hearing they're here. They're here. And they're not being regulated. Right, Mark? Right. Yeah, we, need to, we need to do that. Yeah, we're talking about adding regulations for the health safety with uh, complying with the health department, having a permit. Like, so all these it, things are covered in the same way a restaurant would. The village would. should know which businesses are operating in the village. Right. That's a safety issue. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and that's part of it too. Yeah. Do we have no permit process right now, or we do and nobody has filled one out? We don't have one. We don't okay. have it. We don't have one. Through, yeah. So yeah, they're... It's not like they're violating our rules. We just don't have any yet. So mm -hmm. right. once but we, we have, have them, the rules. these are the rules. So. Yeah, but I'm okay <laughs> with striking out the private guests thing. I think that's hard to enforce, and it doesn't bother me that somebody has a food truck on their own private property. I but I like all these other rules. Uh, Franco did mention that it. We do have it set for Friday to Monday. Do we want to just say Saturdays and Sundays instead and limit the days a little bit further? So it's four days. They might be filling that. gaps when other things aren't available, though. Like Mondays are. Well, then yeah, why don't we say Monday. two days a week instead of specific instead of noting specific days? Or making them circulate different food trucks. Like that's if they have. I, yeah, that gives. That's too a, much regulating. Well, yeah, that's too <laughs> much. <laughs> <laughs> just like, well, if we're avoiding no, having a permanent business set up as a food truck, and we don't want them to be there all days of every day. Yeah, I'm we have to think about the enforcement customer. requirements too. I mean, I think know, manpower is an issue. For I mean, putting all these regulations. A food in place. truck village is actually really cool. That would in be Portland, uh, when I visit my sister, there's tons of them. There's big banks of food trucks where you can try 20 things at all of them. Um, so I don't want to destroy competition and say these businesses aren't allowed in our town. We only like these kind of businesses. Like, it does work in other villages or cities where they can allow this variety and it doesn't ruin the whole town. We could just <laughs> implement this one, come back in six months and see how we think it's going. And we then could. have another I think that's a good start. I, I would say... And scratch the private scratch guest the thing. Private okay. Without reading this entire ordinance, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> do we have, right now, a limit on how many times a specific vendor can... I think we did at one Was it point. ten? We did at one point, but that was for the downtown area. Oh, so that's right. Okay. Yeah. Which so we, just generally, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. I okay. don't, don't think so. Yeah. 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 Well, no, the, they apply for permit. It's, it's how long does permit last? A year? A year. So I mean, during that year, though, they there's no limit on how many times they can show up right now, as long as they're within these hours. Which I mean, I feel like these hours are set to thinking that they're going to be downtown. That might I be don't the know case. If they really need in general. Yeah, on Saturday and Sunday, we're seeing them out there in the afternoon, early afternoon. Yeah, I don't Well, is the, is the time well, restriction six. specific yeah, to public spaces or private spaces? 
It applies to all of them, <coughs> any public or private space. I think there's something to, the, you know, limiting the number of days to to the week. Yeah. And then, it's the, like it's the hours in the day because I'm thinking like if I'm having a party and I want to have a food truck in my driveway for my to cater my party at seven o'clock at night, I can't. I, I also have that question. Is this applying to commercial properties only or is this applying to residential as well? If you were having a private party in your backyard, mm -hmm. could you mm -hmm. have a food truck didn't, on Wednesday night? Didn't we discuss we, commercial we only? Fall, I think that would fall under private, um, a private property, residential. Wouldn't, yeah. yeah, be included with that. So, do you want to have a carve out for residential? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's cool. Uh, there's language in there that if it's a resident that applies for it, the village administrator or the board has the authority to be flexible. That's already in there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Then we're close. Right. Okay. We did throw in that oh, caveat. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> you could say yes. <laughs> Which might be good for a block party yeah. or something. How many times have you mm -hmm. read this? <laughs> yes. Enough to wake up <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would say we should change the hours uh, from 10 a.m. to whichever is earlier, sunset or 8 p.m. And, and um, I would personally, I would, I would make it for now, seven days a week. I don't I have a problem. With that. Yeah. Personally, no, I'm not saying we have to do that. Personally. I always like the weekend thing a little bit more. I do too. Mm -hmm. Okay. But or for events majority. with permission, if we limit the days of the week. And mm -hmm. I mean, they can always come back and add. I mean, if somebody wants to have it, and then they have to justify it. I guess it's going back to whether, it, since we're thinking mostly about on private property, making sure that the business that the business's main business or, or is what they're supposed to be doing. Or should we regulate and say that they have to be open? <laughs> if it's a business, you're saying Actually, it's, it's yeah, not that's bad great. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, too. Okay, so I agree. With that. If you're yeah. be in a commercial space, it needs to be during uh, open hours. However, how would that apply to uh, the truck parking area, the Terra Business Park? Because it's really. Why is there always some exception? <laughs> well, I'm just, I don't know how we do it. Oh, no, that's that. fair. Like, no, yeah. it's yeah. totally fair. They're open 24-7. They are yeah. in and out all the time. People are coming and going. No matter yeah. what. So yeah. they would be open, to, since they're open 24-7, they would allow to be allowed to have them Friday, Friday to Monday from Friday through Monday. 10 a.m. to sunset or okay. 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, fair. Yeah, that's, that's fair. fair. If you're a 24-hour business, that makes perfect sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, <laughs> do we have exclu exclusionary areas? Are we going to say nothing in the downtown for the time being? Although we have a food truck downtown every Thursday, Thursday and yeah, right now, Wednesday. Wednesday. There's already a carve out for village sponsored events. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, do we just say a blanket? No, not for for now. Nothing in the downtown. I think that's already yeah. in there. I think it's it's it should. I think it's in there. It should be in there. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I know we took out the allowed zones, but I don't know if that means also that we have no allowed zones. Right. So we took out all the zones. Right. In downtown. Yes. Then, yeah. It has to be on private so property, right. so it can't be on streets. It can't. Oh. It can't be on any mm -hmm. public there property. Be on the gravel lot. <laughs> so who's got private property to put a truck on in the downtown? Anybody? It's, uh, it's pretty limited. Yeah. 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 Blair. Yeah. Hi, Blair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. What's the downtown area you consider? Yeah, how is that? How is that? Uh, so I've got an extra plot of land in between uh, my place and Rogers. Don't complicate this place. <laughs> <laughs> it's 815. I mean, they don't sell alcohol, so it is good for bringing people to the town to go to get drinks after. Well, again, oh like I said, we can revisit this yes. in six months and see what's working and what's not. Yeah. And then if we find that if you want to do something different, we can, we can do some amendments. It's discussion and direction. Do you have what you need? I think. Okay. We got it. Yes. <laughs> so we'll bring it back. 
probably at the next meeting. Okay. Sounds good. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank okay, you. we'll move Thank on you, then to <laughs> Thank you, Franco, yeah. reports. Thank I'll you, uh, start out by uh, mentioning and thanking everyone on staff for the wind down. And uh, our, just last week was uh, really well attended. Um, I was going to suggest anybody who wanted to check out Motor Mondays before you go home, do that, but I'm sure they're closed by now. Uh, also, too, just a reminder, um, Kevin's probably already told us all about it, but the IML conference is coming up next month, so if you haven't uh, communicated or if you have a, a desire to take in any of those sessions, conferences, stuff, that um, let her know which ones you want. And uh, that's, that's about all I've got, so let's start with Andy. Uh, just a follow up on a couple things to keep on the radar about the parking at Hager in those spots uh, where we have open spots where we could have parking. Um, just hoping that's being pushed along that people could open openly park there. Um, and then maybe putting signs out to direct bikers using the trail to go over there so they're not using up valuable downtown spots. Talking about the north lots on Main, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really That's good a idea. Really good if idea. They'll use them, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, they're on a bike. They're just getting on the trail. They don't really care if they're... Right. They might want to be near restaurants for after the ride, but it is a lot easier wow. for bikers who are just using the trail, and that's it. Um, but, yeah, we don't really direct them anywhere, so maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but it wouldn't be hard to say cyclist have, parking. We, would, we did have direction for them to park down... On the lot, on the lot behind Dukes. Is that gone now? No, I don't no, think so. I, I don't think that. Oh, true. Yeah. But yeah, maybe we push them further. Nobody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't yeah. mind if I'm, I'm a biker. I don't mind. No, but that goes up. Much, that yeah, up. we need we need it now for walkers. How much participation do we get on that though? But, but when are they parking? Are they like parking like Saturday and Sunday mornings, or are they parking? They're not parking like. I think on weekends. Probably uh, early. early morning until the afternoon, yeah. um, but the busy time when people are trying to go to the farmers market and uh, the Sunday market. And yeah, it's a, and when I ride on the weekend, I try to go way around that area anyway. So I think the cyclists would like parking not in a bunch of foot traffic. So I think it's cool. a good spot to put them. They do park on top of the Yeah, it's yeah. today. Yeah. But not during like the dinner hour <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, in the morning, yeah, yeah in the morning. And we don't have an immense amount of people trying to park down there. Usually. Well, they have to be out of there by sunset. Yeah. Well, that's off the, the trail by set. sunset. In theory. I've got I mean, but then you're bike. still parked <laughs> with a bike hanging off the back, going down River Hopefully Street. Hopefully, they're in a <laughs> restaurant. All right. I don't uh, mind if we say go park down by Hager, but I just don't want to. Tell people to camp park. I mean, I open to anybody parking, parking there. Yeah, but yeah. signage to That's push them there as well, especially. Yeah. Um, and then another, just follow up on the notification system. I know that that's being looked into, but uh, I get pinged by people every once in a while, hoping that's coming along. Um, and that's all. Okay. Trustee Saviano. So, um, Easton Yards Council, we're discussing with our budget that um, we would love to commission a mural in the front portion, what street is on? The, the Dodor Line property, the yellow, the obnoxious yellow, just yes. until it is, because um, there's tenants for a while, so if we can put a mural on it for a couple of years. Are you talking about the fence? Like, no, the... Um, the it's a railroad. The one on Railroad oh, Street, the yellow, the that side, front. The end of the yeah, the end of it. Um, we have budget for it, and then we can at least beautify it for a few years while it's sitting there. I just facing can't, I can't, tequila valves. Facing tequila valves. Oh. That that that's that side. Um, so that's something that we are talking about and would like to propose moving forward on. Just so you know where our head is at. Where is this building? I'm sorry. Where is the building? The, the yellow it's building. Across from tequila that. valves. Put the something yellow. cool on that. Okay. Building. So that's only going to be up for like two years. It's yeah, three. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. to do something for while it's sitting there, uh, yellow. Very yeah. Very <laughs> while it's sitting there, yellow. <laughs> Even Roger Aaron yep. hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's that's, that's on the radar. Rich. No report. Scott. 
Uh, no, uh, Kathleen. Um, yeah, a few things here. Um, I actually wanted to thank Public Works um, for all the great work that you did on the frontage road across from the BP. Um, the residents sound like they're thrilled with everything. Um, and um, hopefully that'll kind of quiet the area. Um, I do believe there was another incident at that same house um, that was in the most recent um, report. Um, so that we still kind of have an issue with some of the tenants um, at that residence. Um, like very corner house? Or? I don't, I don't know which one it is, but it, it was in the report, um, and it was mentioned that was the one that was across BP and suspicious, or they were involved in somehow or another in that shooting. Yeah, one of those houses got hit, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, I just want to say, sing praises for <coughs> the, um, whoever the contractor was that did the road resurfacing up in the estates area, um, uh, Council Hill and all that. They did a spectacular job on multiple fronts. Um, the speed after grinding and then doing the, the finishing was great. Particularly nice for the people that do walk in that neighborhood because it is a walking neighborhood that the shoulders and the packed limestone was, is, was watered down it was it's really well packed um, and it makes it a lot safer especially when we've got cars coming down um, the street that the narrow streets um, so um, for people that do walk in the area residents and, and other people that do walk in the area um, they also did the aprons into the driveway Unlike the people that did Bonnie Dundee, sorry, I'm gonna complain about that because they only did the roadway. They didn't go into the aprons of the driveway, um, which is where it had stopped prior. The road had stopped prior, um, so, they, so it's a nice, clean um, transition. They also went in towards the mailboxes because we've got, we've got, um, so that the mail tracks aren't like just going off into the shoulder um, and going off the shoulder, creating mud messes and all sorts of things that we're dealing with. So they did a great job. Um, and I just will really want to highlight um, how happy I've had like three or four other neighbors as we're walking around um, compliment it. The, other, the only other thing um, that they had to say um, was that there was somebody that's new that just moved in like a year ago. And if we can be noted, they didn't know the street was going to get resurfaced. So if there is either tags or something that we can put into the their their utility bills that's saying, hey, your your street is going to be up for um, for resurfacing. Um, congratulations. <laughs> um, that. Um, that that's a, a nice thing so that they can plan accordingly um, if they've got um, uh, any concerns with that. So that was that. Um, <clears throat> then um, I have now heard from five people in, uh, about the Ravine Road. Um, Scott Kramer came in the last meeting and had a lot of really good information about that. Um, since then, um, I've also heard from, and I've gotten permission to say, um, basically, Patricia Miller at 650 Ravine, Yvette Andre at 655 Oak Ridge, Sylvia Boder at 642 Ravine, and Julie Finnegan at 621 Ravine, and Scott Kramer at 101 Crabtree. They're all right in that area. Their biggest concern, um, Real is is the speed as well as the school buses and the braking noises when they're at um, I think it's Hawthorne before they turn on to Ravine um, that that is um, uh, uh, still uh, an issue that um, they have a lot of concerns about. I want to thank Chief for your 
your feedback on that um, and I'll try and um, if I give you these these addresses it sounds it's it, it sounds like we the next step is to do a traffic tra study feasibility for the speed bumps is that what my under is my understanding correct I think so it's a multi-layered approach yeah. of I've asked both chief and Phil to sort of look at what we've done and what we're still evaluating and what we possibly could do. Mm -hmm. And part of that puzzle is that there's now, we've been told, 150 less kids going to that school this year. Mm -hmm. So the, the drop-offs and the pickups should be easier. Um, so we want to do a little bit of monitoring before we make any decisions. Yeah. So I think a comprehensive overview of the what we've done, what we're evaluating, what we could potentially do down the right. road compile that into some messaging to the residents might be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. that'd be good. the school district to talk about using that or not using that as a bus cut through? I think I mean, if there's no, had that conversation with There's them. no stops or drop-offs or anything like that for the kids in the uh, Lakewood Estates area, but if they're using it just from, you know, ease of, you know, uh, ingress egress kind of thing maybe we can get them to just talk to the bus drivers and say go around and we'll talk about that i did talk specifically about that i talked about the circle drive and how they were using that mm -hmm. uh, their parking lot was kind of set up for circle drive i was thinking hey we could maybe alleviate some of the backup issues by utilizing circle drive well yeah. they were already using it as a circle drive um, There's yeah. Yeah. yeah but as there was much here said that yeah, and Scott had mentioned that last year. So maybe it's that you know the, basically the principal told him something similar last year. But then as the year went on, but now they're the whole redistricting happened That's this this sure. year. So maybe maybe it will be less of an issue. But yeah, monitoring is probably you know, definitely the right thing to do. And then the other thing is um, really the buses and the trucks using both Bonnie Dundee and Ravine to get back to the lot um, when they are not picking up or dropping off students right. and putting them onto some of the other main roads like Barrington, because that's, that's practically just as easy and feeds right to the lot. Um, that are, are more properly sized, that have sidewalks on them, that have curbs, that have you know <coughs> lines down the middle of them, um, and have better sight lines. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then when, with regard to speed bumps too, Phil, uh, you and I spoke about this in chief. Uh, there's been a, a call for them up in the terrace uh, along Aberdeen and Braeburn specifically, and <coughs> to do that, look, look for the ones that could be removed because they get really beat up by the plows. So if we can put the kind in that can be taken out, you know, with metal anchors, that would be preferable. Is that okay. it? Um, the last thing I had is um, uh, El Jamal is open. Um, they seem to be very happy. Um, I was there on Sunday um, my, for my second time Spoke with Rosa, the grand opening is planned for August 30th. She doesn't have an exact time yet. Um, and they're hoping that um, they have the hold up with No Manchas and there's another restaurant where they're doing like full food prep um, on things is the water, um, the, the, the water um, heaters, the oh, water heaters, the water heaters are, are, are undersized for what they're putting in, so they have to replace them, um, and they're working on getting that replaced, as well as the fire suppression under the hoods, I guess it's this Wednesday, I think she was saying. So um, as soon as that can get straightened out, then they'll, they'll, they'll get No Manchas' truck off the parking lot, and they'll be opened up in there. Um, and then the other one in the back will be open so as well. So um, lots of traffic there.
lots of lots of business going in and out of there. It looks great. Mm -hmm. and it is looking good. Is that it? Mm -hmm. Okay, Sarah. Um, the only question I had was actually about Max Freeman Park, which I will not direct to <laughs> staff today. Um, so no report. Okay, please. No report. No report. Prince. Phil. No. Chief. No. That's it. Here oh, I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> No worries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we normally have a meeting um, two weeks from now, which would be Labor Day. We're not doing that, so we're having our next regularly scheduled meeting on September 9th, which will be mostly a committee of the whole, possibly one or two small action items, but lots more good discussion to come. Yay. I will not get that meeting. Is there any desire to move that meeting? <laughs> another day because I don't remember if I ran it past you or not but so right now we have September 16th is designated as our strategic planning long meeting from mm -hmm. 5 to 9 we have three other Mondays in September because there's five totals so we have the 9th the 23rd and the 30th so if people have a preference I am completely open I don't have any, but uh, mm -hmm. just the I and O only. Yeah, it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I think. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, right. Yeah. The twenty third. Thursday is the uh, lawyer. Reference uh, for the twenty third. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How does everybody else feel? It's okay. That works. Um, that works. I'm available. All right, then available. we will do September sixteenth and September twenty third. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank, you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. I'm in Tinley Park till five on the night. <laughs> No way. That's all. All right, cool. Uh, uh, we do not have executive session. No. no? Okay, great. Well, then uh, I will Thank entertain you. a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. All right. And, Second. Uh, Second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We'll see you in another couple of weeks. Is there, is there rock, paper, scissors? I wonder which one. Oh, <laughs> I like to switch it up. <laughs> we did. Oh,